Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I'm Joseph Attic, Executive Chairman of ID for Africa, and this is our 32nd livecast. I'd like to warmly welcome you all and thank you for being with us for the virtual continuation of our augmented general meeting or AGM, which will consist of two exceptional livecasts, this one today and the next one coming up in two days on Thursday, June 30th. Many of you may have attended the physical part of the AGM in Marrakesh and or have watched day one plenaries in streaming. As you may have witnessed and may have heard, ID for Africa 2022 in Morocco is being hailed as the best meeting we have ever organized. Despite lingering limitations due to COVID, huge crowds from our community flocked to this, me this meeting with passion and enthusiasm. The agenda was very pertinent and responsive to current needs, and we are pleased with the apparent success of the workshops. The four workshops on day two provided a different format for interactions, one that privileged collaborations and brainstorming among members of working groups instead of passive listening the feedback that we received was overwhelmingly positive. We thank the development partners, DPGA, IOM, UNICEF, and the World Bank, and the contributors for the important role they played in ensuring the success of the workshops. As promised, we will now move into the summation portion of these workshops through the live cast medium. We will cover workshops one and two today, three and four will be on Thursday. Here is today's agenda, which is made up of two parts. Each part will loosely consist of three segments. I will first engage with the workshop leaders to understand what the workshop was about, get an institutional perspective on the topic, and discuss some of the key takeaways. Then we will talk to a select group of contributors about their reactions to the findings, and will ask them to enrich the discussion by adding context and local perspective. I am keen to give you, the audience, the opportunity to ask questions throughout and to elevate those who have something to add to the community voices. This is your opportunity to be heard, so prepare your questions, comments, and your camera. Just raise your hand and an operator will prepare to elevate you to the panel at the appropriate moment. Before we start, I'd like to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their continued support of the live guests. We're now ready to start part one of our episode, which we focus on digital public infrastructure. As a reminder, this was the cast of the physical workshop. We invited a small subset to join this live cast. So let us welcome to the stage, Liv Nordhag, co-chair of this workshop, and who's also the secretariat co-lead for Digital Public Goods Alliance, Sanjay Jain, who has a long list of impressive affiliations, including chairmanship of MOSIP uh, Technical Board. She's also the co-chair of the W1 workshop. Rosemary Kisimbo, Executive Director, National Identification and Registration Authority, NIRA, Uganda. Stephanie de la Le Lebriol, Operations, Communications and International Relations, Secure Identity Alliance and OSIA. Yodahe Zimaikel, Executive Director, National ID Program, Prime Minister's Office, Ethiopia. Colleen Elliott, Global Digital Identity Strategy Lead from Microsoft. And Mark Straub, CEO of Smile Identity. Thank you all for being with us. We look forward to hearing from you within the different segments. Let us begin segment one. Operator, please prepare the stage. Sanjay and Liv, thank you once, once more for chairing this workshop and also for taking the time to be with us to report on it today. Um, I wanna start by just helping the audience reorient, especially those who were not with us at, at the physical workshop. Uh, Liv, what is precisely digital public infrastructure, which is the, which is the title of this workshop? Thank you so much, uh, and thank you so much for having uh, having me here, uh, and for having uh, had the opportunity to co-host uh, and co-chair this workshop together with Sanjay. Um, digital public infrastructures are the foundations that uh, can support basic society-wide functions. Uh, 
of countries. So they typically include digital identity, civil registration systems, payments platforms, and uh, and uh, secure data exchange platforms. Um, so they are often referred to as the rails that other public and private services and innovations uh, can run on top of. Um, so uh, the word digital public infrastructure is often, the term is often used um, interchangeably with digital stacks. So there are many, uh, but they tend to de describe the same. Um, and they are particularly relevant for um, uh, country resilience uh, in the face of uh, the recurrent crisis that we have seen now. Uh, um, and, and it seems that um, each crisis is replaced by a new one. So uh, these digital public infrastructures are, are needed to provide basic services, but also to be able to have resilience in, in facing the unknown and, and future challenges. Thank you. So, okay. So these are basically government systems, foundational government systems upon which um, the government can build service delivery, can manage the needs of its populations, etc. cetera. Uh, Sanjay, um, this term did not enter our vocabulary a long time ago. This, this term entered our vocabulary uh, recently, uh, maybe three, four years ago. And it's um, basically um, some of the credit belongs to some of the work that you have done. So, so bring us up to speed, sort of what is what brought about the realization that we need digital public infrastructure? So thank you, Joseph. Uh, so this term actually came into being from the UN Secretary General's report, uh, where they were uh, talking about how to bring about, uh, I guess, digital inclusion, get the SDGs done. Uh, but the work itself started uh, in India in the past, uh, I would say, slightly more than a decade, where we started working on uh, identity. And we felt that for it uh, to be useful, it had to be digital, because that's where the world was headed. And so we wanted to make sure we had something which was uh, certainly uh, usable within the context of other systems. And so it was, we saw it as infrastructure. And as we went about the process of rolling it out, we also started to build on various use cases. And that's when the value of the identity system started to become even more apparent. And so, you know, it was really a journey. We started with identity. We went on to bring people into banking. We did uh, direct benefit transfers and then digital payments. And now we are talking about how we can use this as a mechanism for empowering people to benefit from their own data. And so I think this journey also uh, made visible to us, ourselves, and to the rest of the world, uh, how such infrastructures could be envisioned. And that's really when this uh, term started to come into being. Uh, and so that's really been the journey so far from, uh, from India. Okay, so both of you, um, we understand this is foundational and it's been in the making because certain country demand uh, for the digital transformation required this. Are we at a point where everybody agrees that there is a standard definition for what is at stack and what is a digital public infrastructure or is this term loosely uh, being used by institutions such as your institutions and others who are collaborating actively? So maybe Liv, you can start and Sanjay, you can add to that. Yeah, I'm happy to start. And I think, so um, I would also love to use the opportunity just to mention digital public goods as part of this, if that's we're okay. Um, we're, com we're coming okay, back, we're coming back. Okay, so, so you, okay, back so I'll get, I'll, okay, that's fine. I'll come we'll back come to that one later. Uh, when it comes, no, 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 that's fine. When it comes to digital public infrastructure, I, I am sensing uh, increasing alignment across stakeholders. Uh, I, I'm very happy to have Sanjay elaborate more on that, but I do see that even though um, it will vary a bit what different uh, stakeholders and countries are talking about when they're talking about the stack, there are some core essentials and they're very much what uh, Sanjay was alluding to. Um, I think there are some uh, differences in that sometimes there are also references to more sectoral pieces of systems that can be seen as, as part of infrastructures. But I think this is in a way, um, uh, if we were talking about the most foundational uh, pieces, I think there is a lot of alignment about what these are. And it, it's very much about what is cross-sectorally most enabling 
uh, and what is um, uh, needed for accelerating impact across all sectors, all use cases and so on. But Sanjay, I'm happy for you to build on this and, and to hear if you are also seeing the so, same increasing alignment. <laughs> there is alignment, but is there standard now? Yeah, no, in fact, that's the point I wanted to make was that while this was the journey we went through, but uh, also what happened with the uh, UN Secretary General's report was he also came up with the definition of what is a digital public good. And uh, that when we created the Digital Public Good Alliance that really took that definition to heart and said, we need to create a registry so that governments around the world can uh, easily see if something meets the definition uh, so there might be other things that meet the definition which we haven't seen yet, but at least there are there is some diligence that we do to identify uh, what fits into that. And so we actually maintain a registry of various public goods, and that's actually out on our website. Uh, the process to uh, get things on uh, and uh, it's all out there. So I think we basically set this up as a way to take that definition and uh, so that the term is not used as loosely as, uh, you know, uh, just to end the term, right? But Sanjay, there's a little bit of confusion here because um, people speak about digital public infrastructure and have spoken about it and, and in a distinct manner um, than digital public goods, um, who, which are essentially a way to arrive at building digital public infrastructure, but, but it's not necessarily the only way. So I think it's important for us to try to understand uh, when we talk about I'm a government, a young government, started from scratch. I want to move into the digital transformation. They come and ask, what is the bare minimum uh, infrastructure do I need to put in place in order for me to build my governance? Are we at a point where we could answer that question or this is work in progress? So the way I would put it is that there's some elements that you know you need. So like, for example, identity is a classic one. And it doesn't have to be a digital public good because that's one way to get to an ID. But you right. could have a ID which is created in a different way, but which is then open to use by other departments, other systems, by the private sector, which then makes it an infrastructure for them. And mm -hmm. that is certainly one way by which you could arrive at that. A DPG is one way, but a DPI doesn't have to come from a DPG. Exactly. So, so that is, I think, very clear now. Okay, so Liv, you want to add to that? Yeah, C can I provide an example of that? Just um, yes. so, so um, I think the beauty we have with, with digital public goods is that there is actually a definition and a standard for digital public goods in the sense that, um, uh, it, and it refers to also the, uh, the open source, so the adoptability and the adaptability um, of it. But there are digital public goods that are not relevant for digital public infrastructure, uh, but there, there are also digital public infrastructure examples that are not built on digital public goods, as, as Sanjay very well um, uh, referenced. So I think if you use the example of, of, of India uh, and of Aadhaar, uh, Aadhaar is a digital public infrastructure. Uh, it would not comply with the definition of a digital public good in the sense of the DPJ because it's not open source. But if okay. countries are looking to build out their um, digital public infrastructure and be inspired uh, and leverage the experiences from Aadhaar but use an open source system, they can use MOSIP, which is the modular open source identity platform, which is indeed a digital public good because it has been built for, uh, for um, uh, as a generically, relevant uh, platform that can be freely adopted and adapted by countries as part of building out their infrastructure. So for instance, the Philippines has deployed uh, MOSIP as part of its digital public infrastructure, which is called Philsys as an example. So, so I think that, uh, but um, so I do think that there is increasing um, clarity, uh, and there are inc increasingly also digital public goods available for other parts of this stack uh, that, that uh, we have been referencing, Joseph, such yes. as, for instance, yes. CRVS systems, uh, yes. X-Road for data exchange, etc. What about payment? Do you see anything promising in payment? So, so in payments, uh, on the digital public goods fronts, uh, you have examples like Moduloop, you have Modulo. examples like OpenG2P uh, and EFOS. Uh, and of course, there are existing proprietary systems or that systems that are not currently open source that could be very promising 
uh, as open source alternatives. And I have said frequently that I would love to see an open source version of UPI, <laughs> okay. which is the Indian that, that, that's, payment that's platform. A different story. <laughs> that's a different episode that we'll get to. Um, <laughs> but that's legitimate. Let, let me ask you, so we're talking about basically collection of systems that are each foundational that focus on performing specific tasks. Uh, digital identity may permeate across all of them. Uh, a payment system, um, a registry, uh, perhaps uh, exchange of data uh, like XROAD and, and others. Now, two issues come up, come to mind that people keep asking about. How do you link these? What is the pipe? mechanism, what's the plumbing that, that is needed to connect all these systems together? Maybe this is a technical question. Sanjay, do, do you want to start us on it? So there are multiple efforts that are happening uh, around this. So for example, uh, under the leadership of uh, Dial, GIZ, and other agencies, there's an effort around GovStack, which is sort of trying to put together a complete stack for uh, uh, adoption by countries. Uh, and I think there is also an element of country's choice, right? So there are, uh, mm -hmm. it's good to have multiple systems because then, you know, you try and uh, become uh, better than the others and countries have a choice in terms of what to adopt. So we don't want to go down to where we have a single system that everybody adopts, but at least we have interoperable systems. We have uh, systems that allow countries to have make the choices that can then fit their local needs uh, because you know, while we say identity, it's different in every country, right? Some things that vary. So mm -hmm. from that perspective, we want to make sure there is sufficient uh, uh, choice as well as interoperability so that it can happen. So we don't necessarily want to go down to a single standard, but I do think that we are getting to a point where we will have countries will have options and they will be able to implement them. And we will work more and more towards interoperability in uh, different at different levels. So that's really the job of standards, I would say. So we, we need standards in order to allow these systems to interoperate with each other so that you can actually have multiple systems and then you can swap the ones you don't like and you can replace them with something else at the same time being guaranteed that these systems will perform the same type of data um, communications as we would have expected from, from the other modules. So, okay, we understand that. Um, and what is the body, if the audience wants to know, what is the body that is working on establishing standards for, is it, is it dial GIZ, is it the GovStack? Because these are different initiatives that, that people are hearing about. Who is setting some of the interoperability standards for the modules of the GovStack? I'm not sure there's a body yet because we have seen different parts of, so for example, lots of standards are really at a much micro level. So for example, we look at uh, uh, standards around say the ID document, we look at standards mm -hmm. around biometrics devices and uh, even biometric data formats. So far, I think standards have operated at that level. And I think there is uh, some conversations globally around operating at a next higher level. And that's something which we are uh, keen to make it happen. Okay. Um, Liv, we're starting to get questions ever since we put up this workshop and the terms started to get uh, noticed. Um, some of the governments are asking the question institutionally, how do you manage the institutional arrangement for digital public infrastructure? Is this basically a coalition of different agencies and ministries that have to bring in their components to the table? Or would this be a brand new organization called the Ministry of Digital Public Infrastructure, uh, the ICT ministry that manages this? How have you seen or how do you position yourself relative to the institutional arrangements for digital public infrastructure? So I interpret your question as being related to how this happens at the country level. Is that the correct exactly. understanding? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Countries want to adopt. They, yeah. they, they are beyond identity. They believe identity in context. So what do I do? Yeah. So, so first of all, um, I will be uh, the first to admit that I know that there are better uh, that there are um, people in the audience that are very well placed to answer this at the more uh, detailed level, including from the World Bank. I would say though okay. that I think what is crucial is to go go beyond an individual sector approach, and that has been one of the some of the challenges we have seen is that uh, you've had sectors that have been trying to take on some of the 
broader horizontal digital public infrastructure channel or uh, challenges so that you've had you know the health sector trying to build out identity systems or similar in in food security for instance or or, or from from um, uh, 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 those kind of angles. And I think the challenge of, of starting from the sector instead of having a whole government approach is that you miss out on the interoperabilities and opportunities to leverage a common uh, in, um, uh, infrastructure very easily. So I think this needs to be a whole government approach. It needs to be anchored at the highest level of government, meaning that you do need to have head of state uh, um, strong backing from this from the top. Uh, and, and some process of ensuring that there is strong coordination uh, uh, among a number of relevant ministries, including most um, the sectors that are most relevant uh, in the use cases on top of the infrastructure, but also, you know, the Ministry of Finance and also, uh, you know, the structures that are funding this to happen. But I do know that there is a very strong knowledge on this among uh, participants. I would also encourage you to tap into that vast knowledge, me, but that is me. my my initial take to answer your okay. question. I mean, Sanjay, if you have anything to add, in the meantime, I'll call upon a lifeline. Uh, anybody from the World Bank wants to join and, and, and help us understand the institutional arrangement and also what are the demand drivers. So please raise your hand and we'll bring you up to the stage. So Sanjay, what do you think the institutional arrangement should be? I, that's the part on which we have the least number of views, uh, rather we have the most number of views and as most of we kind of stay away from that. But uh, I do think that, uh, yeah, I mean, there are better people than uh, me to talk about. I can talk about our experience in India, but that's not applicable everywhere else. Okay. In India, how, how is it working? So in India, we ended up with the ID system being uh, initially a separate entity completely from the rest of it because we envisioned it as a, a foundational ID and being too close to one ministry would prevent its adoption in others. And so we actually ended up being completely separate. Uh, and But more recently, it's uh, been, uh, uh, it's got into a reporting structure under the Ministry of uh, Electronics and uh, Information Technology. So there is a more uh, vertical place for it than a horizontal. Uh, but then the individual DBT programs are under different ministries and our payments body was set up as a independent entity owned by the banks. So, uh, so from that perspective, it's actually not owned by the government, but by the uh, various banks in the country. So overall, we have a very different structure than I think would be applicable in many other parts of the world. Many other parts. Okay, this feels like magic. We call on somebody and then he appears. Jonathan, thank you so much. Jonathan Marskell from the World Bank. Um, you've heard the question. Um, basically, we'd like to understand what are you seeing, two things, the institutional arrangements that are sort of gravitating towards, people are gravitating towards. And then the second sort of what uh, are the country demand for DPIs and, and what's driving it? Mm. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Joseph. If, if you rub the, the magic thing, the genie appears, right? Um, from, from, from Jakarta. Um, look, in terms of the institutional arrangements, um, there is definitely no one size fits model, right? Because every country has their own political governance and, and, and social um, ecosystem uh, and context. So for example, in some countries, actually the, the development of things like DPI. So um, as Liv mentioned, DPI is really supposed to support a wide range of functions in the economy. And often it's, it's hard for a ministry, which is an equal of other ministries to do that effectively, right? Because they have limited power over or influence over other, um, uh, other ministries. And so sometimes there's agencies established that are attached to the head of government or the head of state that have a, a bit of a elevated uh, uh, role um, and are able to, to work and, and use influence to, to get other stakeholders on board. In other cases, there's ministries of ICT or ministries of digital economy that have the power, that have the capacity and the influence, and, and they can get things along. I think what's very important is when you get to the um, at the start of implementation and, and during the design, that there is um, that there are strong leaders as individuals, right? That that can bring this along, that that can that can inspire people, that can convey a story, that can bring everyone on board, um, and in. In likewise, um, the, the the importance of, of building that capacity. And this is one of the advantages of, of digital public goods is that 
by allowing countries to see the, the source code, to see the protocol, to see the specifications. This really builds capacity. There's countries that we know who are exploring open source software, whether it's for ID, data sharing, or other functions, they may not adopt the software, but by looking at the code, by looking at the architecture and the documentation, they get better understanding. Um, and that brings me to the, your second question, Joseph. Yeah. In terms of demand for, I mean, for digital public infrastructure, it's massive. Because of the COVID uh, pandemic, countries realize that in order to respond to crises like that um, and crises in the future, that countries need to invest in, in more than silos, that they need to build these rails, just like um, highways and railroads were built um, uh, and, and are being built um, uh, today. Um, when it comes to digital public goods, I, I would say the majority of countries are seriously um, considering this as an option, right? They're studying it, they're looking at what their options are, and importantly, they're examining um, whether this is something that's sustainable for their context, um, and they're looking at, at, at things like, you know, do we have local systems integrators? Could we build local IT industry? Um, they're also trying to grapple with issues of vendor and technology lock-in. Now, open source software is not a panacea to that, right? But it can help address that, along with the capacity issues I mentioned earlier. Let me, let me comment on, on the institutional arrangement. <clears throat> One year, this year, we've noticed something very, very dramatic, which it's the barom barometer of what's coming. Um, this year, the number of ministers who are the ministers of digital transformation significantly exceeded the ministers of interior. Usually, we used to have at the annual meeting, the minister of interior would show up. And, and now you are seeing a major shift, which is the digital transformation ministries are sending not only the large number of delegates to attend, but also the senior leadership is coming in and saying, you know, um, DPI is what it is about. Identity fits in context. So 100% in agreement with you that, that we are right on in, in, in saying that digital transformation, which is something that every country in the world must be pondering about right now, not just because of pandemics and war and crises and all of that, just because of efficiency and, and, and business practices, changes that you have to do. So, to do. Um, so, uh, so thank you for that insight. Um, the World Bank has been engaged with, with, with many, many countries in that. And so you bring a very, very pertinent insight. What I wanted to ask, um, before we, we bring in some of the contributors, I wanted to ask the co-chairs um, to share with us some um, of the takeaways that they thought came loud and clear in, in the workshop. And, and, and then this is a moment, uh, oh, Jonathan, thank you for, for being with us. Uh, please feel free to, to join in again. Um, so some of the key takeaways that you noticed during the workshop before we bring in the, um, the, the contributors to get the context and localize the discussion. So, uh, so I think uh, I was there for most of it and Liv had connectivity issues, so I'll take care of some of these. Uh, broadly, what I noticed was, you know, from the panelists that we had, we saw that, you know, three of the panelists were on their way to implementing a digital ID platform and were on, at different stages of the journey and that they were actually finding the necessary support and the ability to uh, make progress uh, quite rapidly uh, through this uh, thing, even though there's a pandemic, they're able to move ahead. Uh, we also saw the need for us to realize that the end of the day, we have to serve the users and the communities and you have to start from there. And I think there was a fairly strong set of voices around that. Um, there were voices uh, and you know they're actually present here, so I'm going to let them speak, but around the need for uh, participation in international standards bodies, the need for cooperation across the uh, various uh, agencies itself so that there's learning without, you know, the influence of uh, providers so that they, they can do that. And I think uh, we, uh, we'll hear those later as well. Uh, and then I think, of course, coming back to the capacity building point, yeah. I think we heard that there was a need for a lot of capacity building uh, across the entire uh, continent. Uh, Liv, this is a topic that's close to your heart, capacity building. I know we've spoken about this in a previous episode. And it seems that in the workshop, 
people have expressed uh, the need for that. What do you think the options are available to the community in order to build such an capacity? Capacity building takes a long time. And so what, what are the development, what is the development community thinking of doing to accelerate that process? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And it is indeed uh, very close to my heart. Um, I will. I think we can say for now that there's an evolving ecosystem and, and a really growing awareness among many significant uh, international development donors also uh, around this, which I'm extremely happy about. Um, and, and I think this, so there are several buckets here. One thing is of course, increased funding, like new funding, fresh money to actually support uh, everything from better core funding of these digital public goods, but also then the technical assistance to adopt and, and implement them and, uh, and over time. But I think there's another side to this, which is also um, about both shifting resources, but also shifting how we work. And some of that is around procurement practices, for instance, and the need for reforming how to support procurements uh, around um, digital public goods when you are no longer um, procuring something proprietary or leasing the right to use something proprietary, but actually pro uh, procuring services to support the implementation of that. Um, and that vendor ecosystem is something that I see growing and evolving, but it's definitely something we also need to help fertilize. I think there is a lot there that goes beyond money, which is also about strengthening um, the, the market, the communication about this huge market opportunity, right? Uh, what Jonathan was pointing to about the number of countries that are now uh, planning to build out the digital public infrastructure, and many of them are seriously considering adopting digital public goods. This is a, a huge market opportunity for systems integrators and vendors that can come in and, and provide these services. But for that to happen, we need to get procurement right. Uh, and procurements, uh, and I'm very keen to hear what country perspectives are uh, from, from our, our other workshop contributors, because this is one of the topics where I think there's a lot of learnings also to share between countries, but um, the multilateral institutions like the World Bank, UNDP, uh, and also individual donors also need to support these types of reforms. But yeah, the answer is yes, <laughs> capacity building is needed. And I think it's happening but it also needs to be accompanied by, um, by these kinds of reforms. And um, I do remember one of the really good comments that was made from Morocco about being forced to build capacity it was also a positive outcome of adopting OSIP because this is capacity that will then remain and can also be leveraged for- um, Other things. Continue, yeah, and for continuing to iterate and, and, and build out future infrastructure as well. So, so it's it's a long-term investment in capacity. So, uh, yeah. Is there anything you want to sort of give before I bring in? You will stay on the panel before I bring in to the panel the other contributors. Is there any 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 point you want to make uh, before we bring them in? From my end, uh, I, no. I, I I really look forward to hearing the perspectives, and and I do want to encourage um, to bring in maybe the opportunity for really have more learning exchanges between countries, including best practices in, uh, for instance, how countries have addressed pro uh, procurement issues and how what other countries can learn. So we can shorten that learning curve for each new country. That would be brilliant to see as an outcome of this. Okay, so so. Sanjay, I assume you don't mind if I bring in the panelists. In fact, I would love to get the other voices on. Okay, so stay with us. Um, please, operator, bring in the uh, select group of contributors. Also, the audience, if you are interested in joining the conversation, uh, please make, make it known by raising, raising your hand and, and to, so that we join the, the, the discussion. Um, as a, to be fair to the new um, sort of contributors, I want to pose uh, a question, pointed question, one by one as we as we animate the conversation, and then of course we'll open it up to a broader discussion. I want to start with you, Stephanie, if that's okay, for, from the Secure Identity Alliance. Um, you represent an industry association whose members are actually leading solution providers. Um, what is the demand your association is seeing uh, for digital public infrastructure? 
And how do you see the industry is responding to that demand? As, as Liv was saying, there is a, a big opportunity and there is a need for capacity and there is a need for the industry ecosystem to be in alignment with, with the opportunity. So give us a perspective on what is the demand that you're seeing for digital public infrastructure? Sure. Stephanie, you are on mute. Thank you, Joseph. Good afternoon. Uh, Joseph, I'm sorry to insist, but we are not just an industry association, as you know, and uh, I really want to pass this message because we, we do have government and intergovernmental agency actively contributing to our work. So when we publish yes. a report, if you look at the references, you will see that we have a lot of government input. So that is really important um, because this is the whole purpose of SIA to be a you know, um, government industry platform for the exchange of best practices. You know, your, to governance enable the... board, your governance board has four industries on it. That's why I kind of felt mm. maybe you should enlarge it to bring in government as well. Is that in the in the work? We we do have today uh, fifteen. Uh, but 15, not sorry, in the 20... governance. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Sorry, we can hear. Sorry. Mm. We have about 20 uh, government who are affiliated members to the SIA, actively participating on a monthly basis in our work group meetings. Right, but so how many of I'm them saying... sit on your board of governance? How many of them are on your board of governance? They're that's, that's affiliated the members, so they're, they're part of advisory committees which are advising yes, the working group, and they participate, you know, invited to our general meetings. And something new since May, because as you know, I've mentioned it to you, Joseph, we have transformed the Secure Identity Alliance uh, in the last few months and uh, registered the association in Brussels. Uh, okay. So now we are a truly international association and we have governments invited to our board meeting. So this okay. is really a partnership between uh, government and industry to be able to really uh, discuss and share best practices, which, we've, which we have always done. But this time we are not doing it officially, if I if I may say. Okay. So, so what yes, is the I mean, uh, that you're seeing? What is the demand uh, from government that no, you're seeing? I mean, for we've uh, 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 th there is a strong demand. Huh? I mean, government wants to avoid uh, dependence on uh, you know perpetual licensing for proprietary solution. Mm -hmm. um, that's for sure. And with uh, digitalization and COVID, this has uh, really accelerated because, as we know, with uh, digitalization, all the silos are falling. So it's not only uh, you know it's not only within the foundational ID, but it's also all the sectoral IDs between uh, department, between uh, ministries, between countries. I mean, digital has uh, in a way no borders. So you know we see a lot of um, challenges. And uh, the industry is really trying to help by enabling this uh, meaningful discussion with government, because you need to transition from a uh, you know, more document-based uh, world to a totally uh, legal world. But uh, with that comes a lot of uh, security, data, privacy, protection uh, issues. Um, you have... Uh, you know, a lot of um, need for uh, control. Um, oh, sorry to, you know, to, to, sorry, I'm getting confused with what I'm saying. So I was saying with all of that comes a lot of uh, challenges. So what we are trying to do is to help government by sharing uh, experience yeah. in other countries. Yeah. And what we can talk about before, you know, from uh, the chair and the co-chair of the workshop, yes, indeed, there is no size that fits all. So open source is, uh, is a way, but uh, I think it's going to really depend on the environment and uh, the level of capacity of a country, uh, because you, you, know, you cannot solve everything with open source. You need to have uh, you know, a mix and match. Uh, you need to have uh, public-private collaboration. You need to have co-creation. You have to interconnect. So this is where you really need open standards. And, uh, you know, whatever you do, uh, technology uh, evolve, they disappear, open standards always remain. And this is, as SIA, what we've been trying to, to do by providing, uh, you know, the OCI initiative, which is a set of APIs, which are very versatile and, uh, are, you know, can be used in foundational uh, ID to interconnect the different building blocks, but also with the functional ID, you know, to interconnect foundational ID with functional ID. 
but this can only be done through this uh, public-private collaboration, I agree. And uh, this is what we've been trying to do for the last uh, 10 years at uh, Secure Identity Alliance. It's to really bring around the table, you know, the, the public and the private sector and together share the experience, the worldwide experience. Okay. And uh, it has to be done based on open standards. It has to be co-creation. And I think Europe is a good model. You know, you, what we see, it's not only, you know, the, the move towards this digital infrastructure, but it's the role of mobile as well. I mean, we haven't even mentioned the word once since the beginning of this restitution, but I think uh, mobile is also a massive driver yeah. and everywhere in the world. And, uh, you know, so you have to think uh, mobile and uh, you know, the way you implement mobile solution. Do you do it in the cloud, in the mobile? How do you access it? You know, the interface, there's so many issues. And also in your infrastructure, you need to, to, you know, you need to mix match. You need to try. I mean, some country have a centralized approach. Other have used a federated. But now we can see that the user is put really at the center. And with the mobile, this is uh, something you can do very well. So you need to also look at, uh, you know, uh, this centralized uh, type of architecture, self-sovereign ID, and all of that. Um, you know, a government right from the beginning shouldn't say, I'm going to go for this type of infrastructure. I think it's better to start from the use case. What do I want to do? What services do I want to offer my uh, citizen? And from there, you can try different uh, approaches, mix the project. And the only way you can, uh, you know, have all these project works together, it's through open standards. So this is one thing that we do is really advocate this uh, open standards. Yes, Stephanie, thank you. Um, I want to get the perspective of the governments who are represented here. We've got Yudehi from Ethiopia, and we've got Rosemary from Uganda. Um, Yudehi, as you well aware, and, and, and Rosemary, Rosemary, in 2018, when we did the survey of all governments, the number one concern that they've had was vendor lock-in. Um, so Yudehi, um, and then Rosemary, how are you building to ensure that you don't end up in a, in a, in a vendor locked environment where you're achieving also your sovereignty um, for, for the system. What, what lessons can you share with others who are thinking of building um, uh, with, when it comes to this particular issue, which is vendor lock-in and planning for the future? Um, Rosemary, or shall I go first? You go ahead, go ahead. And then we come back to Rosemary. We can see the impact of vendor lock-in and also talking about the community. I'll, I'll talk to her about that. So go ahead. Yeah, happy to see everyone uh, and happy to see you again. Um, so from uh, our perspective, um, the fact that uh, a resource or a platform is open source is secondary. The first question is, is the design good? Is the architecture good? Is it fitting? Because uh, free uh, open source and free software, it's the second uh, criteria. The primary criteria is, uh, does, it, uh, is that, does it meet our business need? Uh, for instance, if it's going to take us uh, uh, three years to implement an open source platform as opposed to one year to deploy a proprietary platform, that's also another consideration we have to take because that means we're going to have to spend two years without deploying a critical public infrastructure. So every country has to do that uh, uh, check, uh, that balance. I mean, should I go with open source and take longer time, bring in more resources, or should I go with a proprietary solution and do it fast without knowing what's inside? Uh, is a black box solution a better option for me? Every country and every project has to have that uh, uh, check. For instance, if I'm running a big, uh, airline or if I'm running a big uh, corporation, uh, my relationship with vendors would be different as opposed to someone who's running a foundational ID program, which, is, which requires data sovereignty, which requires really long-term thinking. Uh, what do we do 10 years down the line? How do we integrate with other foundational systems, with GovStack, et cetera? So uh, really the fact that, uh, for instance, Mosip in our case is open source in this free, came second, uh, we first looked at, uh, is it modular? Uh, does it allow us to integrate with any of the vendors, the hardware manufacturers, the EBIS manufacturers, et cetera? So those were uh, 
those were critical factors in, in our decision making. Uh, and obviously, second came the fact that uh, it's open source. Uh, you know, between 2020, when we first downloaded the platform, and now in two years, we've seen a lot of change in MOSIP, for instance. Uh, so if someone is just being introduced to MOSIP as of 2022, um, they would face more difficulties because of all the changes that have been happening with every new version. So the fact that we, we've spent two years learning and growing together with the new versions kind of gives us an edge as, a, as, a, as an implementing entity. Uh, we've also opted for uh, an in-house system integrator, which I mentioned last time. Uh, that's also a choice that every, uh, uh, you know, every project has to make on their own. Uh, does it uh, make sense for our resources in terms of our deadline and et cetera to rely on uh, uh, a team that's uh, learning as they're building, or should we bring in a team that already knows everything, that knows how things are done and uh, deploy it within uh, a month or two. So for us, when we, when we initially made the choice, it was more of, this is the only open source platform out there and it's modular, the architecture is microservice based, we like the architecture, so let's test it. Uh, if it works, it works, if it doesn't, well, we'll look at other options. But uh, through time, we uh, zeroed down on uh, going out with the country rollout uh, with, this, with this platform. Now, Uday, what is the scope of your project long term as far as the digital public infrastructure? Put it in context. Are you going to go after a stack or are you just going to focus entirely on just building the digital identity? Um, this uh, idea of a gov stack, obviously, uh, we've been... Uh, discussing and we've been developing different ideas between national, Ethiopian National ID and other government entities. Uh, for instance, we've had uh, discussions and uh, planning, uh, planning sessions with uh, Ethiopian National Switch, the one that interconnects all banks. Right. So uh, we, we're, we're thinking of, uh, we've also had discussions with uh, Root CA, the PKI infrastructure agency, it's a cybersecurity agency. So obviously digital ID alone or digital ID with uh, very few uh, relying parties will not be the answer, will not be the silver bullet for everything. But uh, this idea of a government stack, we were uh, very actively thinking about it. Uh, in fact, as uh, Leaf said, we'd like to see more, uh, more platforms, uh, open source platforms coming in into this space into the government stack, whether it's a, a digital local or a content management system uh, or a UPI kind of uh, open source system, because it would really help the digital transformation of uh, a lot of countries. Okay, so hold on to that thought. I wanna go to Rosemary. Rosemary, you mentioned during the identification arena in Morocco, you felt that you were sort of locked in, vendor, vendor locked in, that's why the future, you were planning to do something else. So can you explain where did this come from and what is your vision for the future for Uganda? Um, for Uganda, we started out with a, a, a very successful project in terms of numbers. Well, it was a proprietary technology, it was a fast, and it achieved some level of success. And into that, I would like to say what Yota has said. Depending on a nation's need at a time, you may be forced to make a decision that may take you a different route. But our learning from that was that without an op Uganda has one of the youngest populations in the world. So how do we get young people involved in their legal identity? And one way to do that is to get them involved in developing the software that will host their legal identity. So in essence, we got a great beating from, no, from a vendor lock solution. It, we still suffer it. You've hosted me here addressing uh, civil society's grievances with our system. And uh, that beating taught us two things. One, we need to be more in control of our solution. And if that more in control means open source, very good. If it means proprietary, very good. And that's where the interpretation comes from. So in a sense, in this, it's clearly meaning open, more on open source and open standard. Why? Op standards live on. 
as, as we have been, as it has been highlighted, standards will live on. So furthermore, we, we need to also think about the fact that what are the other needs? Because this digital good or digital infrastructure, it lives within an ecosystem. What is that ecosystem? I'll use the analogy of a human body. If it's a digital identity system, what is the ecosystem with it we need to treat? What is the geographical context of this legal identity? What is the his political and historical past of this legal identity? So it doesn't leave, it, it's, it's not in isolation. These technologies are how, but this how lives within a certain context. It is important and we are trying to understand and the, the, the information that we get, the feedback that we get from the civil society, it's probably because we did not fully address our legal context. Did we, I mean, our geographical context, uh, our current implementation, does it realize that 35% of our country is covered by forest and water? Does it understand that we are hilly? So in essence, yes, uh, our vendor locking in taught us many lessons and also now began to dictate that uh, something about procurement, which someone mentioned. How do we get young people to build the next solution? Because the current procurement law says you must have five years of experience, you must have a company. But these yeah. are freelancers, these are young people. They just know how to code. And they are working for Google and Facebook. They don't have a company. So what uh, government is trying to build an innovation hub where you host such talent and can call on them from time to time because of the simple fact that we, it, it's, it's, it's a learning, it's our context, and also it's within the fact that we need to address our environment as it is now. So but also your capacity. Your capacity. I mean, this is a wonderful way to build capacity. If the government has programs that privilege um, these incubators and, and these young people and get them involved in developing yes. what the infrastructure the country needs, this is a wonderful way to build knowledge and and uh, and, um, and capacity. Yes. So in our this in this particular, we are at we are the threshold of acquiring a new system. We stumbled into MOSIP. <laughs> As a result, it has caused us to also review OpenCRVS and OSIA. So we have done a, mat, a mapping. We've picked our act, our ROPA act, and said, look, this is our act. What does OSIA answer? What does MOSIP answer? What does OpenCRVS answer? How easy is it to bring all these frameworks into one as a solution? Right. Is it plausible? And then on top of that, how easy is this to get, get this done within eight months? Because we need, uh, by, by some legal provisions, we need to start this exercise in the next seven, eight months. And how easy is it to get young people to do this? So there has, there's been a review of a university that has an incubation for uh, projects. So are we going to take the root of that? Those are all discussions on the table. So yes. At this threshold, we have looked at three frameworks. We've compared them against our law and against our functional and technical specification. We are deciding how to do uh, uh, the young people, local content. Are we going to, we have just decided to give it a goal that we want 60 to 80% of our IP owned by Ugandans. 60 because there, there's, there's ABIS, which right. is an algorithm that, uh, no, even no, no open source yet offers. PKI, right. there's some of those that are still proprietary, but we are saying at least let's go 60 to 80% okay. in, in terms of proprietary and, and yeah, thank okay. you. Rosemary, hold on. I wanna bring in the private sector um, and also the private sector to a little bit outsider up until this moment in time to our community. I wanna welcome Colleen Elliott from Microsoft. Uh, and of course, Mark Straub, he's no stranger to you, but he is still a newbie in this uh, field with us. It's been the field that has been going on for 20, 25 years. Um, Colleen, I'll start with you. One of the key issues um, that a lot of people in our community, when I say our community, it, which is represented by government agencies um, and the development agencies and the traditional uh, industry, the identity industry and, and credentialing industry. Um, 
many um, actually ask the question, what role do you think the, te the technology giants uh, can play in accelerating the development agenda and the development of digital public infrastructure? Um, is it basically um, helping provide technology? Is it providing your experience in building incubation? Is it infrastructure? So, so explain to us, what do you think the role such as Microsoft and other big, big giants could play in accelerating the development of the ecosystem? Well, thank you for having me uh, on the panel to recap the workshop. I really enjoyed the AGM. Uh, so congratulations on a successful event and happy to be here today representing Microsoft. Um, you know, a lot of great comments have been raised so far. And as I mentioned in the workshop, you know, I do have 14 years in the public sector, specifically uh, some of that time was spent building a digital ID program and system. And I learned through that experience that government can't do it alone. And when you are a government embarking on this journey, like Ethiopia just mentioned, you've got to do your homework. They spent two years, you know, really investigating their path and they had very clear criteria about what they wanted to achieve, like the outcomes in addition to, you know, providing this new identity capability. Um, and I absolutely agree, digital ID is one of the foundational components of a digital society and digital infrastructure. Um, I think when you're talking to the big vendors, the big tech giants, thing, important things to keep in mind are their experience and expertise, not only in running and operating large scale systems, but securing those systems. Um, mm -hmm. We also work across the digital economy, as I mentioned as well. We work with identity providers and relying parties uh, who both fundamentally play you know, foundational roles in a digital ID ecosystem, in addition to serving end users. So having that breadth of experience and exposure and capacity to scale is really what we bring to the table. Now, uh, Microsoft, in addition to other vendors, strongly support open source, inter integrate with open source components, build on and even fund projects. So I definitely encourage you to Google that, <laughs> um, you know, take a look. You'll see uh, on our website, Microsoft.com, we have a page all about open source and supporting those types of projects. Um, and then lastly, digital skilling, right? Building capacity has been a big theme here. And we definitely support, you know, digital skilling. Uh, we have a commitment uh, announced through our Microsoft uh, African Transformation Office that was launched a year ago to train uh, 30 million youth on the continent. Uh, we have an agreement with Ethiopia around training a million youth, and that's going all the way to uh, ensuring that you know they are ready for jobs, right? So really there's a breadth of benefit to collaboration. Um, one thing I love to see, and we do a lot as well, is that co-innovation with customers. So it's really under important to understand that it's not a black and white conversation. It's not open source versus proprietary software. It's what components do I need for what, which ones are going to meet my needs and designing and architecting, you know, a hybrid approach is really how we can refer to it. Um, so really do your homework, really get out there, talk to the, the vendor community, talk to the industry community, understand the open standards so that you can go to your counterparties within your ecosystem and to the vendor community and say, these are the standards we're trying to comply with. I mean, we strongly support open standards so, and that's an area of expertise at Microsoft. So, you know, we're willing to have those cu customer conversations to help them understand that landscape. So there's just so much that we can do together. So don't be shy in terms of entering that conversation because it's not just about licenses. It's not just about you trying to lock you in. It's about trying to build out and scale digital identity in an open standard based manner. That's that's our focus at least. And so we love to collaborate with customers in terms of just understanding their needs and, and testing the technology. 
Malin, do you think the tech giants have ambitions to be directly involved in identity management um, and providing a, a, a private sector alternative for digital identity to government uh, or, or, or official identity? Do, do you see the, a role like that? For example, I mean, we were seeing in the developed countries, the wallets um, that, that Google and, and, and Apple and others provide are providing a platform for authentication, et cetera. Is there ambition for the big tech giants or is it more like we're here to support you in whatever your plans are? To be honest with you, I think it's both. Um, when you're designing a digital ID, ecosystem. So talking about the players, the technology, the policy, there's various layers that you have to consider and choices that you're going to need to make in each of those layers, right? So uh, Microsoft is the largest security uh, company in the world. We also have an identity stack. You know, parts of that stack have, are op they're based on open standards, but we have open components. We have software development kits. We're very public, you know, and have a strong developer community. So a lot of it is about support. We also have a massive partner network of vendors that offer identity solutions, everything from biometric, you know, verification to wallets. So we couldn't do that without open standards. So I think that's what it comes down to. Now you have some other tech giants that have, you know, a product and a strong product in a particular area. You have vendors who deliver physical cards today and who are now moving into the mobile card space and providing proprietary software around that. You have vendors with very strong wallets. So you don't want to discount the experience, the innovation, the security, you know, and the scalability that has really gone into these solutions, right? You have to take a step back and say, again, at this layer of the digital identity ecosystem, what choices do I have here and evaluate them? Uh, and as government try to, in a neutral manner, say, you know what, this is the best course based on our capacity, based on our needs, based on our law. So, you know, you're going to find a mix of both. The, the key thing is to really take your time and do your homework. Okay, this is a great way to summing so far what we've talked about is basically you can't come up and say the answer is there is no answer. The answer is do your homework and each fact pattern supports a different pathway. There are multiple pathways to arriving at your solution and it passes through capacity building. If you don't have capacity, no matter what, if you don't have capacity, you're going to be locked either by the vendors because you use a proprietary solution, which is an end-to-end, yeah. or by the open source, because you're going to be relying on a system integrator that will do it for you. So capacity is really, really the key issue and being able to transparently collaborate with others. Hold on to this thought. I want to go to Mark. Mark, you've been sitting patiently, and you are actually represent, you're the CEO of a company which has been active and operating in, in Africa successfully. Um, you run an identity authentication company and um, you are dependent, your company is dependent on digital public infrastructure. And for me, digital public infrastructure is critical infrastructure. So what happens when that critical infrastructure fails, meaning it's not reachable, it doesn't connect, or it's down, the server is down. How often does that happen? And what is the recourse that, that you have in building resilience to deal with this issue? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Attic. Um, so yes, I am, uh, I'm the CEO of Smile Identity, and we represent really private industry that is reliant on these ID authorities. And so this is critical infrastructure, obviously for the citizens of these countries. It's also critical infrastructure for our business and all the relying parties that we work with as part of this business. And, and what we have seen ultimately is that the largest challenge or the most significant single challenge to, uh, to relying on public infrastructure is sometimes uh, downtime. Uh, and I thought I'd just share this very quickly, this graph that we put together that just kind of a, a sample of an ID report that we're putting out in a couple of weeks. But this is um, a screenshot, just we took and aggregated all the data we've seen over the last uh, 30 days or so. We did this uh, last month before the Moroccan conference. And we saw that there was on average 5% downtime across the board, across ID authorities from country to country. And we operate in a half dozen countries across Africa. 
And what happens is when, when we can't query a system, when it's down or when it's uh, returning um, bad messages because of some failure in some code base, uh, ultimately it's not just um, it's not just sort of our business that's impacted, but if you think about this, it's a farmer that's not getting a loan. It's a community that's trying to buy maybe a solar system and can't access the database it needs to to register themselves. So that could be a school or a small business or a home. Uh, it's somebody who's trying to sign up for a bank account and can't get access to that bank account. It could be somebody that's trying to send money uh, via remittance product. And when I say it's somebody, it's not just one person. When this stuff goes down, it's 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 people in a given day that get locked out. And so if you think about this from, from a sort of critical infrastructure standpoint, you wouldn't build a bridge and tolerate that 5% of the time when cars yeah. drive across it, they crash, right? That would just be unacceptable. Well, now that we're building this infrastructure in, in the digital space, in the virtual space, we need to think with the same, the same standards of, of uptime and reliability. And, and I guess I just wanted to add one comment to the folks that were talking about um, the demand side of the equation. I thought there was a question from somebody, what about, what do we do with countries that don't have the infrastructure or they're further behind? I know obviously the, the participants on this panel, um, Rosemary uh, from Uganda and, and Yudahe from Ethiopia, I think these countries are further ahead in this journey and they've already made the investment. And I think we're grateful for it. Um, but there are many countries that have not, yet, have not yet made the investment and may be struggling with this decision. And I, I guess I would reference, there's an old movie quote, uh, if you build it, they will come. Uh, yeah. And what I, say, what I mean to say is if you build the digital ID infrastructure, industry will come. Startups will come to your country. Young people in your country will find work with those startups. They will write code. They will become part of digital communities. Banks will show up. Digital financial services companies will show up. Travel companies will show up. Payments and remittance companies will show up. And even the ones that are existing in your country will have the ability to scale beyond their existing infrastructure and onboard thousands more consumers and citizens. So there is demand there and there is industry that's willing to come and show up in these markets and invest. digital infrastructure critical to making that happen. So we're big proponents of this, this entire movement. Okay. Wonderful. Um, while the operators are bringing in some people from the community voices, I want to throw it open to anybody on the panel so far um, who wants to make a comment or follow up on a comment that they made earlier or react to anybody on the screen. So we're bringing in the, the voices, but it takes a few seconds, few minutes. So anybody wants to um, wants to take this dialogue forward? So I just want to summarize, you know, something that I heard in the panel earlier and today. So I think uh, the two, three factors, one was clearly around open standards, but I think more importantly was starting from the users and use cases first and thinking about what you need, building capacity to make it happen, then making it happen. But then from what I heard from Mark was, I think about uh, cooperation between various ID agencies, and that's also a form of capacity. So if you think about, uh, all the ID agencies in Africa talking to each other, there's a lot of knowledge sharing that can happen. And I think ID for Africa is a great forum to make that happen. Uh, and then taking these voices and making them, you know, part of the global standard setting processes, et cetera. I think that's, again, something that will elevate capacity within the continent. And I think, you know, we should look at uh, how we can achieve all of these. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I see Ramesh joined us. Please state your name, your institution, and um, your, your own community voices. So thank you for being with us. State your uh, comment. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ramesh Narayan. I'm the CTO at MOSIP. And uh, yeah, I've been responding on the chat and we have been looking at questions around open standards, industry collaboration. I just wanted to share uh, the perspective from MOSIP, right? Because there are questions on why open source or closed source. I, I find that the, uh, the choices made by governments are being well thought through, uh, just like Yorahi uh, talked about it on how Ethiopia chose their solutions. And I believe that the standards conversation that we are part of uh, has been very interesting one. We are one of the first 
DPGA is to be acknowledged for open standards, but yet we don't keep harking, harking about that in public saying we are a standards body because we understand as we interact with more governments, more use cases, more bodies and working groups that it's a the evolution that's uh, happening and there is a long way to go before we can say, hey, this is a standard which the government can actually pick up and start using, right? Uh, it's future ready and they don't have to worry about it. So uh, what we do in MOSIP is bring in the modularity and the ability to plug in as many of these standards or support as many of these as possible, right? And this could come from an implementation in one country following one standard could then be made available in open source readily uh, for another country to adopt. So we are trying to promote as much as possible the use of open standards, but we also acknowledge that these are evolving. Uh, we also come from a different perspective that we are looking at it from the governments and the users and the good ID principles, while industry comes from its own perspective, what they have built and how they can evolve. Right, so uh, as part of that, I can give you an example that uh, nobody was addressing standards related to interoperability of how biometric devices can be, uh, one can be replaced with another. Today, we, we just fire a print for a printer. We don't really care about what the printer driver is, but when it came to biometric devices, nobody was thinking about it. So we are working on those missing pieces and trying to make those available. Wherever the industry is addressing uh, standards like for example for credentials there is an effort on we try to align with that wherever the missing pieces we try to promote these uh, new initiatives from our side and all these initiatives i believe should be elevated to international standards bodies such as the itu or iso or uh, ieee and uh, we see that even in uh, our engagements with osia and all there are attempts to make these standards as part of uh, ITU. So we welcome uh, the broad basing and increased participation from many, many people in order to help these standards take, take root appropriately. So another word that we've heard a lot about in this session is our standards, the need for standards, open standards for everybody to, to really be adhering to and, and supporting and promoting as a community. Uh, Yanis, uh, thank you for being with us in the community voice. Please uh, state your name, your organization and your purpose. And I will come back and ask a question uh, to the whole panel after Yanis makes this point. Thank you, Dr. Atik. Um, I'm Yannis Sidoru. I'm head of Digital ID at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change uh, based in London. So we support a number of governments, particularly in Africa, on their uh, roadmaps and implementations of their Digital ID ecosystems. Uh, so I just had a question mostly rather than a comment. Uh, and the question is, having heard from the various sort of panelists on their experiences for, with both open standards and open source, solutions, whether it's MOSIP or, or other extra and others. I wondered whether um, panelists are, are either themselves have published or are aware of any reports that were published that outline the sort of the benefits and the challenges involved in using either of those approaches, open standards or open source solutions. Um, because I think, I think the community will benefit from, uh, you know, seeing and, and hearing and learning from uh, those countries and, and understanding those those risks and challenges and, and how they were addressed, if any. Um, so so yes, question if, if uh, any any such materials or reports exist. Anybody is aware any? of any report that compares the two? I know that they, they, they address different things, mm -hmm. but um, there is an overlap. Anybody anybody would like to um, answer Yanis's uh, question? Stephanie? I mean, I've, said, I've already uh, spoke with Yanis about that. I really believe we shouldn't oppose the two. I mean, uh, like, for instance, you know, OZIA, it's an open standard. And uh, as Ramesh said, you know, uh, hopefully soon recognized by the ITU. Uh, it's been developed in open source because we are talking uh, interface level. Uh, and it was developed in open source. So uh, I think, you know, open source is, uh, is an approach and uh, there's different way of uh, approaching open source as well. You know, the IP rule can be different. I mean, uh, in IP um, rules, you know, you can have the bazaar, what the lawyers call the bazaar mode. You can have the cathedral mode, you know, there's different uh, IP licenses approaches to open source as well. 
So I don't think we should oppose it at all. Uh, you can have, a, I mean, all the vendors that develop proprietary system, they also use open source. Huh? They're proprietary, but there's open source inside the system. So open source is really a, a language, you know, and uh, I don't think there's an opposition. I think open standard is very different. It's making sure that in a digital public infrastructure, every block you use, and there can be a mix match of open source, open, uh, you know, proprietary, off the shelf, uh, developed uh, in house. The idea is that at the end, all of that needs to work together across, uh, you know, a department, across, uh, you know, ministry, as I said, across borders in some cases, mobile, web, in the cloud, you know, all the, and all of that has to work together. So the way you do that, it's through interoperability and interoperability can only be done through uh, open standards. Because as we said, open standards remain technology evolved. Okay. Okay. Um, so before I get to the next um, community voice, um, there is one issue that which seems to recur and actually came up at the annual meeting several times with people asking that. And, and this is, Unlike the Greenfield initiatives, which we, we featured Ethiopia and we featured Morocco and, and, and Philippines, the countries that are having to make a transformation where they've, they've had a system, uh, Uganda is a perfect example, Rosemary, you have a system in place which is very functional and it has um, uh, enrolled people in, in the database. And in the next two years, you're thinking of going out there and, and redoing or expanding the coverage of your ID system. The question that people seem to be asking, and here today they specifically asked you, um, is basically, does that mean you have to redo as you transition towards a more open system? Does that mean you're gonna have to redo the, the database of uh, records that you have? Or do you think there is a way that you have total openness on what's already existing? Thank you very much, Dr. Atik, once again. Um, before I answer your question, let me answer two questions. ID4D reports are a good place to go for uh, some publication. They have a summary of challenges and experiences of each country. Um, and one for Liberia. Liberia, my view is start. Start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I, from that, I would say Uganda's example we realized that we didn't have enough internet penetration at the, at the time. We made a decision for an offline system, which was carried in a box. Now internet penetration is better. So we are not going for an offline, we are going for an online with an offline capability. So don't be deject, just start where you are, right where you are within your circumstances. Whether if there's little power, get batteries, you go get solar, but start somewhere. So next, uh, I'll now I'll go to your question on, yes. do we lose everything? No, we shall not lose everything. We are going to migrate that data. And that is where I would like to also highlight. The most important thing about any system is the data. That data is the gold. The workflows, the data are the gold. The, the, the information in the workflows and the data is the gold. So our focus is on migrating this seamlessly to the next system. The other part is a how. Today we might use open source, open standard. Tomorrow we might change our minds and say no proprietary is better, but the data, my fingerprints will remain my fingerprints. My face will remain my face and it's securing that and moving it securely that is central to us. So we are going to migrate the data and build upon it. And still to Liberia, one step at a time, the more you use data, the cleaner it becomes. Every iteration of automation gets you better to a better place. There is no big bang one time, it's the best. You will, your learning will deliver your next best result. Okay, okay, great. We, we did have a community voice operator. What happened to the, the individual which was on the screen? Did we lose his connection? He's um, rejoining right now, Dr. Atik. He's, he's rejoining, okay, okay. Um, Mohammed Bashir, are you? Yeah. Uh, yeah please yeah. State, state your name, your function, and uh, your purpose. Yeah, Mohammed Bashir Ali Aziz, uh, CEO of ICX Solutions. We've consulted for the NIMC here in Nigeria. Okay. 
and uh, we're also delving into the authentication business. So what I wanted to contribute is having seen the journey of the NIMC in Nigeria, uh, it's very important for IED authorities to ensure that the whole idea of having a high He's holding us at a most critical point. Reliable. So the whole idea of reliable. Well, 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 Muhammad, repeat. Yeah. You so, froze, so you froze at the most important point. Okay, so, so the idea of having a very reliable and highly available authentication service right. has to be part of the design at the stage where yeah. the ID authority is beginning to onboard citizens and legal residents. Because what we've seen is, in Nigeria is the authentication service became some sort of a retrofit. You begin to enroll people as a database grows, then you now see the need to utilize the data. So it's very important to have that at the very stage of planning. So that, that is what I wanted to contribute and, and, and probably add. But, well, I mean, you and Mark may, may, may have, a, have a point of overlap here. And I would ask, um, and of course, uh, Sanjay, uh, Adar is doing, I don't know, billions of transactions uh, so far. The question is, how do you build that high availability? I mean, this is not brain science. It has been done by other systems. Is it just a question of, of, of building IT infrastructure in a redundant way? Or, or what, what, what needs to happen? I mean, clearly, we can't have 5% of the transactions falling out because the system is not available or it's going under maintenance. Um, so, so anybody? Me, yeah, Sanjay. let me take that. So when we did Aadhaar, uh, and Aadhaar currently is doing about a billion transactions a month. A month, uh, yeah. And uh, at its peak, we are actually doing about uh, two to two and a half times that number. Uh, because, mm, I mean, there were some changes because of law when the numbers came down. But at peak, we were doing uh, about two and a half to three billion transactions a month. Now, when we built the system, that was one of the design choices that we made was to make sure that authentication was very... Uh, so in some sense, enrollment is a more complex problem because you are looking for uniqueness and deduplication. But in authentication, it's a one is to one match. And it is you know what in computer science you would call is a trivially parallelizable problem. Yeah. And so that meant that if you can get your infrastructure right, you can actually build a very uh, scalable solution. And which is what we did. It, I think to do uh, that many transactions, we planned for uh, just 10 servers, you know, back in 2010 uh, would suffice to do that. And then we replicated it so it was highly available. But this and the design choice, which is coming up today, is a little more, you know, the decentralized ID conversation that has been going on, uh, plus the uh, possibility of smart cards, et cetera. All of those without a central infrastructure also allow you that scalability. But then you don't get to be able to brag about those numbers because you never see them, right? But uh, that I would say is another option is to find a way to do it that it doesn't hit a central server. And mm -hmm. I think uh, those are your design choices, uh, depending on what you see in terms of the network, what you see in terms of uh, how you distribute the ID and so on. So I would uh, say that today there's a lot more options are available. Yeah, in fact, one of the things that we are hearing at ID for Africa is that many countries are considering a different strategy of, of verification where they maintain in a centralized way the enrollment and the duplication and the attestation. Basically, the idea that if a ministry that's in a sector, let's say health, wants to know, does this person exist and is this person unique, then the central uh, agency of identity management will respond by saying, yes, this person exists, they are unique, etc. From that point in time, the sector which is health, uh, finance, or immigration, whatever, can build their own distributed um, or alternative decentralized authentication system such that each time this person is asking for a service from that sector, it is the sector that ends up verifying using even biometrics or other uh, PIN codes or smart cards or QR codes that have nothing to do with what was used for the enrollment. And so this way you distribute the verification process and you, you alleviate the load 
on the centralized uh, system. And so I think that's the direction where, where most probably will happen. There is one resistance to that, which is the revenue generated from the verification is going to disappear. And some of the agencies that are invested heavily in building the identity database are going to say, we did the hard work and now we don't get to monetize it. So that's a conversation we need to have. OK, um, I think we are running out of time. So I have time um, just to hear uh, one last closing um, comments. Um, maybe we can hear it from the chair. Liv, do you have anything to close uh, the, this overview with? Um, sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, I think you, you're, you're, you're welcome uh, to uh, give us an overview. <laughs> Thank you, and I want to be put on the spot, so thank you for that. Um, I, I do have a comment, and I do think, um, I do want to correct any kind of interpretation that there's a choice between either going open source or proprietary, and I think um, the, um, the example that uh, with Aadhaar is a good one. Aadhaar is not an open source initiative. Aadhaar is not open source at all, but it's the government of India that is in control of how Aadhaar has been built. And okay. I think that's the essence of the question here. Sovereign. Um, yes, it's sovereign. And India had the capacity to build its own system. Many of the countries that are looking to build out their DPI today, they do not have that capacity. Let's just acknowledge that. Um, and the question for them is, if they want to protect their sovereignty, what to do? Yeah. But I do think that that's a point we shouldn't miss. It's not about like either you do open source or proprietary. And some countries are even implementing open, I mean, many are implementing open source as proprietary solutions, but they still maintain that sovereignty. So it's not either or, and I think it's kind of oversimplifying something. The other point I just want to make, that, make at the ending is capacity. While uh, a perception of a lack of capacity is indeed a challenge if you're considering adopting an open source solution to build out your DPI. It is a tremendous challenge if you also want to do a procurement of a proprietary system as part of your DPI, because getting those specifications right, that's not an easy feature. And the challenge if you get the procurement of a proprietary system wrong, and you don't have the specific, like the uh, uh, contract terms that allows you to make local adaptations uh, built into the contract in a good way and something that gives you that agility and flexibility. No one can anticipate exactly how their journey is going to be uh, when planning this. Yeah. So there is something about um, capacity is regar required regardless. And there are many, many examples of failed proprietary uh, or leases or proprietary systems as well. So I don't think we should say that you only need capacity if you're adopting an open source system. That does not mean that it's not complicated and it's not a quick fix. And I completely agree that, you know, for most countries, they will do both. But uh, I, I do think it's an important point to make, particularly where sovereignty is most needed, that even when uh, when, uh, when going the proprietary route, I think it's really important that countries um, try to have procurements that don't lock them in for many, many decades, even sometimes, <laughs> to poor mm -hmm. systems uh, that do not meet their local needs. I just want to end with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you to the chairs, the co-chairs and the contributors, those who came with us today, but also those who participate in the workshop. Uh, as you can see, this is not a prescriptive uh, event. This is about dialogue, communication, allowing people to understand their options and choices and share experiences so we can learn from each other. Um, we intend to continue this type of um, platform of um, knowledge development and we'll bring them to you um, as, as they become available. Um, now we've reached the end of this part. So thank you, operator, please prepare the next panel. Um, so I'll say goodbye to, to those of you who joined us. Um, and then uh, the audience, please stay with us for another very passionate session, which will discuss the um, the uh, workshop, second workshop, which is the frictionless borders. Uh, so before we start this uh, session, um, I'd like to extend uh, our thank you to Infineon uh, for subsidizing in part the session, which helped us defray the expenses of bringing some of discussants and contributors to participate in the physical workshop, um, whose content 
remained editorially uninfluenced, as you know, and led without constraints by our development partner in this area for frictionless borders, the IOM. So we're now ready to start part two for episode. And so this uh, please operator show the cast of the full physical workshop. Um, so this is the full cast. This was chaired by the IOM. And uh, we've had a whole ensemble of experts, discussants, and, and, and contributors. Uh, we invited a small subset to this live cast. Um, so let us welcome to the stage. Operator, please uh, bring to the stage Damien Thorio, the head of Immigration and Border Management Division of IOM. Alvina Sam Joan, Senior IBM Regional Thematic Specialist for West Africa IOM. Alexander Mbenzi, Director General, Directorate of Immigration Services, Kenya. Rosina Sinona, Director, Department of Home Affairs in South Africa. Esadu Bubakar Sise, who is the Police Commissioner, Minister of Interior, Niger. Um, so, Operator, uh, yes. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. I have a feeling we've had some delay in bringing people on, but now we see some. Um, I look forward to engaging with each one of you within the different uh, segments. Um, actually, we're missing... Um, Dr. Um, Atik, uh, Rosina yes. had a, a technical difficulty. She'll join soon. Uh, okay, she will join soon. Okay, no, no problem. So why don't we... Um, I thank everyone for being with us. I will engage with them in the next segment of this part. But first, uh, operator, please prepare the segment number one, where I would like to talk to IOM representatives um, about this workshop. So Damien and Alvina, thank you so much once again. Um, I've heard a lot of good things about the, the, the workshop. I want to start by asking you, Damien, to remind the audience what the workshop was about. You are on mute. After two years, one still hasn't learned. I was actually thanking you, Joseph, for the, for the initiative and, and noting that just as the other participant, my whole computer stopped about 10 minutes ago. Oh. So I'm quite happy to be able to be back with you. The, the, the whole purpose of the workshop was to talk, look at identity management for frictionless border, basically looking at how we facilitate cross-border mobility, both of people, but also of goods, because goods move with people, amidst a background of increased exposure to risks. We've talked about the risk related to public health, but it can also be risk linked to security. And so the objective of the workshop was, was to look at practices where we can integrate identity management into border processes, along with enhanced coordination among the different entities that work at a border and the universal access to legal identity to promote predictable, frictionless, equitable border management during times of crisis specifically. Okay, actually speaking of legal identity, in fact, the, the COVID pandemic uh, happened at the time when IOM was launching a uh, legal identity strategy. Um, and maybe, maybe COVID accelerated it, etc. So what was IOM's objective in launching a legal identity strategy to be part of um, your work practice in frictionless borders? Sure. Um, well, let me elaborate on this a little bit more. I mean, yes. for us, identity is a key element for safe and regular migration. Mm -hmm. Without identity, you do not have safe or regular migration, basically. And that is why, broadly speaking, the theme of legal identity and border management is a priority for us. We, we've heard it, but the, you know, I think it's always worthwhile saying it again. You know, while we recognize that you know, the, the right to an identity is universally recognized, we still have from the World Bank, at least, at least over 1 billion people who don't have access to documented legal identity across the globe. Yeah? And close to half of that in Africa specifically. Now, this affects individuals. It naturally affects the migrants. It affects the IDP. It affects the refugees. It affects the returnees, people who want to go back to their home country. And so for us specifically, migrants who don't have proof of legal identity are increasingly using irregular challenge, uh, channels to migrate. And by doing so, they're exposed to increased danger, smuggling, trafficking networks, et cetera. And even children who are, you know, if they're not registered at birth, we see that they are more vulnerable to trafficking and of course, vulnerable to being stateless. 
And as such, the, the universal access to legal identity and to legal identity documentation is crucial for us. And you know, as a UN agency, we always talk about the sustainable development goal and how that is a priority, priority for the system. Now, we've had the workshop, and I'm sure it was no coincidence, on the 16th of June, three months exactly before International Identity Day. And right. there was a call from you and from others to recognize that the SDG objective 16.9 to provide legal identity for all is a crucial one for, for the UN. As a UN agency, logically, we align to this. So for us, not only do we echo this request for you know, the formal recognition of an International Identity Day, but because it's a cross-cutting issue for migration management, because it also fulfills the, the global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration, especially objective four on legal identity, legal identity for us provides protection for migrants, it reduces vulnerability, it ensures access to rights, access to services, and if people want to come back, it enables return, it enables readmission. So clearly, it's paramount to us, and the DG then asked us to promote a whole of IOM legal identity strategy, which, as you acknowledge, was, was launched three months ago. And, and it's really important to understand this is, while it's an IOM legal identity strategy, it's also part of our engagement yeah. with the UN Legal Identity Agenda Task Force. And yeah. we've been a member, an active member since the inception. And so we this strategy is a further support to the UN system-wide effort to advance legal identity for all. Mm. Uh, I, I can talk to you about various areas yeah. of focus that we have, but I think that you know, I've, I've spoken enough on legal identity. I, in I, I think we'll come back to that issue. I want to get a little bit more um, context from West Africa, from Alvina. Um, Alvina, you're based in, in, in West African region. You're familiar, you're aware. Um, I wanted to understand how did legal identity in that ECOWAS region, let's say, and the free movement protocol, has it led to a positive mobility or facilitation of mobility of people? Can you, can you speak about the experience that you're seeing in the ECOWAS region and in the identity management? Just a little bit to warm up the conversation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Atik. Um, let me start by saying that um, free movement is largely successful um, in West Africa. Indeed, uh, in the wake of the free movement protocol, which uh, dates back to 1979, we've seen that intra-regional migration is very predominant in West Africa with up to 80 to 90% of the migration happening in the region. So intra-mobility involves primarily labor migrants, seasonal and circular movements, movements of students, and family reunification. It is also important to note um, the importance of intra-regional cross-border trade, mostly um, on a small scale. Hence, uh, we see how um, it is an important driver for cross-border movements um, in the region. I could give you uh, more trends of um, the success of intra-regional mobility in 2021. Um, just a few more facts on uh, a report that IOM um, worked on for 2021, a region on the move, where um, we've seen more and more um, mobility due to um, labor, to um, new, new sources of, of livelihood um, in the region. Now, other uh, significant drivers of mobility are also business related, um, traveling for, for markets um, across the borders. Now, while mobility trends may evolve according to shifts in national um, policies and economic opportunities, the routes, they remain um, stable. But as you know, in this region also, um, cooperation and trade dynamics is often also played in a very precarious and unstable uh, context, um, which, which uh, has turned borderlands to be more prone to clustered and high intensity violence and violent attacks that have increasingly spilled over the border. Now, what is required to address this situation is um, indeed the need for better infrastructure, better technology, public services um, at the border areas to secure borderlands and um, to promote national cohesion. And hence, uh, uh, again, the conclusion is that the critical need to ensure frictionless borders, implying better technology, infrastructure, and capacities of identification. But of course, upstream and even in parallel to this context, there needs to be strong systems and 
processes for legal identity. Also, given the rapidly evolving context of West Africa, which hosts one of the largest displaced populations worldwide, um, people forced out of their uh, places of origin. So what is needed is more and better local systems for civil registration as one of the factors that inhibits access to legal identity is the need to travel, the need to spend time and money to obtain um, documentation. Um, very quickly, Dr. Atik, to name a few in initiatives in the ECOWAS region to facilitate access to legal identity, to border communities, to people on the move, um, and to foreigners in general. I would like just to mention quickly some examples. For example, how the government in Benin has decentralized access to legal identity, how it's deploying resources to reach remote communities, register birth, how um, an interagency collaboration between IOM, UNDP, and UNICEF within the whole UN approach have collaborated to strengthen the civil registration and vital statistics office in, in Sierra Leone, for example, with IOM specifically working on standard operating procedures for registration of migrants and stateless persons. Um, uh, other quick two examples would be Cabo Verde, where we jointly um, worked with the government to digitalize registration of foreigners and how in Nigeria, um, the border management information system, the uh, IOM development one, the migration information data uh, analysis system was adapted from a border management system to a system that can also register foreigners. We also had the government of Nigeria at that time providing an amnesty period for all foreigners to duly register and obtain um, relevant documentation to regularize um, their state. Thank you, Dr. Atik. Excellent. Actually, um, uh, Damien, I want to come back to you um, about clearly what is happening in the world um, today. Um, we have been, I mean, the, the, the borders in the world, we've been through many um, sort of health crises, especially in Africa. If we talk about Ebola, um, we've had many scares that went around and in, in, in many pandemics uh, or perceived pandemics at the, at the time. Um, and so they, they led to short-term changes and, and some health measures. And, and then finally, we go back to um, standard operating procedure, which eliminate these, these new measures. What appears to be the case today with COVID, something foundationally or structurally different is happening. Is this just my impression having traveled recently? Or do you think we are now at the cusp of a new world where health has to be an integral component of what happens at the border and not an afterthought? What do you think? I mean, I, I think you're your travels and, and all our travels as we go around the world and the uncertainty that we see, you know, do we need our digital certificate? Do we need this additional element? Will it be read at the border? Do I have the, 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 latest, uh, the latest vaccine card? I think that it's undeniable that COVID-19 has changed the way that cross-border mobility is managed for the foreseeable future, right? I mean, we, we have, it, it's still early. So the lessons are, are still fresh, right? But it's a good time to reflect as, as you suggested on, how can cross-border mobility can be predictable? And then I think that is one of the terms that came out in the workshop quite strongly. How can, how can we have more predictability even during a time of crisis and a health crisis? And to do that, you need to fully integrate the public health and the protection concerns. It's no longer just a, just a security issue. And, and we know, you know, I mean, the, the immediate reaction was we close borders. That's right. we know that you know, international recommendations from WHO were saying this doesn't, is not really particularly useful, right? And we know, for example, we, we had data on, you know, by the end of March, 2020, but I, I'd encourage you to look at, at our IOM website because we have data that are, is regularly updated. But yeah. at some point we had over 40,000 travel measures in the countries, right? With travel bans popping up and all this uncertainty has a direct impact. And it's a long-term impact because if you look right now, you know, in my email, I got an email from Lufthansa saying, well, you know, we're, we're moving from zero to 90%. It's not going to be easy, right? Our focus is also, well, what is happening at the land borders specifically? 
because at the moment you stopped, and that's what Alvina was talking about, the moment you closed those land borders, it had an immediate impact on the, on the, small, the small traders, the people moving goods, basically. And if you're a landmark country, then you no longer have access to all of this. And, and we know this went on for the best of two years. It impacted international mobility. It impacted tourism. It impacted business travel. Uh, e even some work that we do with UNHCR on, on refugee resettlement, that had to stop. So, you know, our thinking, and I think that was your question specifically, that within the global compact on migration, we took the opportunity at the, at the IMRF, uh, which is the Migration Review Forum, to, to have commitment from states to say, okay, we need a more predictable approach to border management, one that balances health security and cross-border mobility. But to do that, you also need to have the strong digital and the strong physical infrastructure and the capacity development to have those tools. And that's why it goes back to legal identity and fixing an identity with the right to travel based on, on your certificates, for, for instance. Yeah? So we're, we're looking at that to have what I would call you know, resilient pandemic preparedness, if you want. But it will definitely need much more legal identity and the digitalization. And that's possibly another theme that came up in the discussion, the importance of digitalization. We see that countries that were able to provide digitalization support to their citizens, remote support, did better because they didn't have to shut down all government services. Right. Now, th there is something um, troublesome about, about whenever you have something as traditional and as established as the border management process with the stakeholders being the immigration, uh, the, the police authorities, uh, etc. And now you're talking about bringing in the health yeah. Um, and and being a being an integral partner at the border, uh, is this realistic, or or are we talking about the the idea that immigration and the police is basically saying, well, give us advisories and we will act on them, or should we see and should we insist on health representations at the border so that the process is is not um, delayed, or is not an afterthought? How do you see the integration of the health into the governance of the border? Well, I mean, it's, it's on one hand a major paradigm shift and on the other, it is not. Because there has been a call for a long time to have all the government services present at the border. You need the phytosanitary. You need the people to deal with cattle going through the borders, right? You need to deal with uh, yellow certificates, et cetera. But health was always given the expression that I use, they were the, you know, kind of the poor cousins of the family. They were right. put aside, had a little room and that's where you had to do your checks. If we look now at the African Union um, integrated border governance document, clearly what they are saying is that, okay, not only do we need to have customs and, and migration working more closely together, we also need those other actors, including health. And essentially, and we, you know, we had a, a, um, hints of that both from Sierra Leone, but also from Kenya, is how do you let go of some of, some of your prerogatives to ensure that you have a whole of government presence at the border. Yeah. And not just for, I mean, not just for control, also for facilitation, right? You cannot have five different stops because you have five different places where you need to show yeah. documentation. That's where the digitization, the integration is going to be important so that you can come benefit from scrutiny of these five services, but either at a one-stop border post or at a, at a single window concept, that's what is going to be important. And the African Union is already promoting that to some extent, I, I know. Alvina looks into that as well. Yeah, Al Alvina, do you see evidence of the the shift in the in the border governance to allow for for more representative integration of the different stakeholders in in the region that you're you're looking at? Yes, thank you, Dr. Atik. Absolutely, as uh, Damian mentioned, this um, integrated um, border governance strategy of the EU that really underscores how policies. Uh, uh, should be on integration, on trade, on mobility, on human security. Um, mm -hmm. Again, this whole of government approach, but reflected specifically um, at borderlands. And um, policies that are taken at institutional level should be um, fully supported to be uh, practically implemented, um, um, actioned at the uh, border areas, which means uh, more integrated border management, whether nationally, but also cross-border. We spoke about 
um, um, the um, borderlands of Africa, the, the, the porosity of the terrains, the remoteness of the borders compared um, to capitals. So uh, uh, how important it is to support borderlands and um, both uh, uh, authorities, but also whether it be local or border, but also um, the communities. So absolutely uh, an integrated approach where uh, uh, all users and stakeholders at a border area are part of border governance. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, before we bring in the, um, the sort of the contributors to add context and, and local perspective, um, Damien and Alvina, could we sort of run through some of the um, key takeaway messages that you thought came out loud and clear in the workshop? Uh, look, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, behind what I had talked about, about, you know, the, uh, the, the friction of the border, the whole element was about legal identity for all, right? And I'll go back to the main point. I and mean, so some of the key points that we brought, but of course came out is that for safe and regular migration, you need identity. And oftentimes a debate about identity is less so about mobility. So that's one of the angles, logically, as I went, that we're trying to push specifically. And it's not just, you know, it's, it's on one hand, the capacity to issue those travel documents and we have complicated standards that need to be recognized, but most countries now are, are meeting those. But also looking at regional movements, we had focus on how do you facilitate movement without the passports, right? How, how do ID cards uh, or tokens enable you to move freely, either as Alvina had spoken throughout, for example, the whole of ECOWAS or just on a regular cross-border movement. If you have to move every day and every day you have to go through the same border post and get checked, that has an impact on your movement. So how can we facilitate that specifically? And then, you know, the longer, the longer term is those changes that we would make in, in the identity ecosystems have a long-term impact on other sectors, such as security and such as trade. And if we want those, you know, uh, free movement protocol and free trade, those are, those are joint saving that will be done by investing in legal identity for all to ensure that the trade movement is facilitated. And, and clearly, you know, the last point that was quite clear is that none of this can be done in isolation, right? You need regional cooperation, you need international cooperation, and you also need the private sector to come in and provide solutions. I, I heard the previous discussion, solutions that are not, um, that, that are tailored, but meet the, the needs of the requiring country, not that are proprietary specifically. And I think that was a very important point that, that came up on a, on a regular basis, yeah? Um, I, I would want to say, you know, from the countries, if I can say for me, there, there were two things that came out. Is one, we need to recognize that countries are already trying to address the jointness at the borders. And two, we need to recognize that some countries such as Sierra Leone have already gone through health pandemics. And so, what I felt was a bit missing that it's, it's not enough showcasing, and I hope we get to hear it now, of how countries such as Kenya, such as Sierra Leone, have actually learned and are already progressing and showing the way in terms of how they want to address all of these challenges. Yeah? And I thought you know, the workshop was a great opportunity to document that, but we probably need to do further because the bad news is that more health pandemics are coming. Yeah? We, we know that for a certainty. So we need to be ready now to not be surprised. Already in Europe where I am now, the COVID cases are going up again, right? And yeah, everywhere. Going to hit us again, basically. Yeah, yeah I mean, definitely. Um, and sort of, were there any discussions about models of cooperation at the workshop? Were, 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 was there any example of a model of cooperation? Is it passing through an international agency or is it bilateral? Can you speak to, to what came out? Well, I can, I, can say one, I can identify one of the challenges that came up and then, you know, the recognition is that at the macro level, at the African Union level, yeah, there are um, policies, strategies that are in place. Mm -hmm. To then have those being implemented, first of all, recognized in national legislation and then being implemented actively, some of those elements is, is where we still have weaknesses and where capacity development is likely going to be needed, both in terms of sensitization and desire to engage on this specifically. Um, you know, countries are, and, and we've seen it, you know, in, in all the countries I've worked, you know, free mobility 
immediately you have from your from your national a concern that people are coming to take your jobs, right? Right. So we need to address that proactively. Then I would say, you know, another challenge that came up, which which is useful and which we as IOM are, are going to be taking up, is the WHO focuses on health. You know, yeah. The ICAO will work on international standards, et cetera. But you don't really have a locus which has the experience of border management and migration health together. And this is where maybe it's very self-serving, where, where as IOM, we don't want to set standards or anything, but we want to make sure that whatever yeah, initiatives and standards come up actually trickles down to the implementation. That's, yeah. you know, that's IOM's value added. It's our footprint We're in every single country of the world. So that is, I think, where we meet the migration health, the border management under the migration umbrella. And we look at what the other agencies are doing and partner with them to make sure that it reaches the level. Because historically, you know, when we were talking about the international health regulations, the idea was that health was going to be present at the border. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, or it wasn't sufficiently. Yeah. So those are the things that need to change now. Mm -hmm. And you think this is going to change in a sort of sustainable way and there's no turning back? Is this, is this a, a, a new norm or are we going to forget about it and go back to the old way of doing things? Well, I mean, of course, it's hard to predict, but give me your sense. I mean, you've, you've seen the borders, you've seen what's going on. What do you think? Has the world changed in a way that's not never going to be the same again? I think, and I mean, I can call on Alvina if she wants to share her views, but I think there are, when we say borders, there are different types of borders. So I think the airport, the, 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 the air borders right. have changed in a manner that I think there is no going back. There's no going back. The land borders, the infrastructure requirements that are needed there will mean that initially we will quite quickly go back to the old ways of doing business. Right. And I think that, that's where we have to be careful because we need to go back to a system which facilitates trade, facilitates movement, but at the same time provides security, both in terms of insecurity, terrorism, et cetera, but also health security. I think that is really going to be the challenge at the land borders. And it's at the land border where the maritime ports come in as well, as well, that we are going, you know, that it's those land borders that are the most essential for trade and development. Trade and the, yeah. That's so the airport, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's bring in the contributors. Let's bring in the operator. Could you bring in um, the contributors if they're ready just to come and we'll continue the conversation with the chair um, as well. So um, I think we will have Alexander Mbenzi. Um, I will have Representative Rosina from um, South Africa as well. Um, I think Sadhu Sise from Niger, I believe. Could you please bring them on? Um, I want to ask the the um, the, the contributors to sort of share with with, the, with us their perspective on how their countries reacted. Let, let's start with Kenya, how their countries reacted and how what changes they've made to their border management process uh, in order to maintain the borders fluid, but at the same time protect other countries from the, the issues that the international community grappled with, the pandemic and the consequences of it. So Alexander uh, Mbenzi, uh, give us the perspective of, of Kenya. How, how did you react? Thank you so much for this invitation and uh, thank you so much for the very informative uh, workshop we had in Morocco. Now, from the Kenyan perspective, I can start by indicating that uh, already we had a very coordinated approach uh, to the way we manage our borders uh, because the issue of health, which is now key here, uh, we as a country had already incorporated the Ministry of Health as one of the key border agencies. And uh, even now when we had this pandemic, we had uh, a very organized and uh, coordinated way in which we were able to work together with them uh, to, to ensure that uh, we deal now with this challenge uh, of uh, COVID, which uh, affected us. I think the only issue which we can say that uh, we were able to learn was now, how do we also have also uh, closer cooperation now with the countries actually at the borders uh, because now uh, 
we did realize that uh, each was having a different approach in, in the way yeah. they were approaching this pandemic. And uh, I think uh, as uh, border countries, we were able to, to learn a lot. Uh, and uh, at time, times came when uh, we had now to sit together and agree on how uh, we need to ensure that there is seamless flow of people as well as uh, goods across the border. And uh, I can be able to report that uh, a, a lot was learned and move, moving forward. I think we now have a more better perspective uh, in dealing with such occurrences. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, it is now an issue which we can address in a more better way. But how did you arrive at that? Did you arrive, did you form a regional committee to coordinate? I mean, how did we arrive or did you use the intermediary of IOM or, or other bodies to get this happening? The challenge is, you, you mentioned it, you, you have a different procedure for dealing with it than your neighbors. So how do we get there? How do we harmonize? There were two approaches. First of all, uh, we had uh, bilateral approaches because we had to form immediate task forces between, uh, mm. between Kenya and Tanzania, between Kenya and Uganda, uh, so that uh, we see how best we can be able to address the issues which were emerging during this pandemic. And uh, secondly also, uh, because of the challenges during this pandemic, we reached out actually to IAM and they came in very handy with the uh, testing gadgets, uh, which could give results very quickly, and also su supporting also with the uh, face masks and also sanitizers to, to, ins to ensure that uh, the risks uh, at the border are actually highly minimized. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So you had bilateral, but you also were able through the intermediary of international bodies to mediate some sort of a harmonized approach. Um, between you and your and your neighbors, are, are there any um, measures that you think are sustainable that will stay with you, even though they were you know you may relax the the I mean I've seen in Africa a lot of the measures have been relaxed, but do you think there are measures that Kenya will maintain in place? By the way, keep in mind we're coming to visit your country in 2023 for the annual meeting, so we'll be all coming and uh, you will be giving us visas to everybody. So we would love to know, um, are there measures that will be sustained in place to ensure that your country is, is, is ready uh, for any pandemics or any health crisis that come? Yeah, indeed. Uh, first of all, we are looking forward for issuing you with visas to visit Kenya. And thank you so much for choosing Kenya as uh, the host for 2023. Uh, definitely. Uh, uh, because of the lessons we have been, we have been able to learn, uh, I can say that we can now be able to sustain some of the measures which as countries we were able to agree and uh, agree on how to move forward. Uh, for example, uh, the, the issue of uh, ensuring that um, we, we have accept acceptability of the various COVID tests uh, which were carried in different countries, but to be accepted uh, in, in other countries, so that also uh, we don't lose time in uh, ensuring that uh, uh, there, there is easy flow of movement across the border. So I can say, yes, uh, there are a number of measures I've been able to share with you, uh, which can be sustained. Mm. Okay, okay, excellent. So hold, hold on to that thought. So there has been some fundamental changes to the way you do things. They're going to be there uh, going going forward. Maybe you've upgraded your borders, etc. Um, let me go to South Africa and get the view from there. Rosina, what do you think are the lasting lessons that this pandemic has taught us in terms of the um, the changes to your border management? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atik. Um, South Africa, in terms of border management, um, had um, in place an integrated way of managing the borders where 
Of course, there will be a committee from various departments that execute functions in borders. So um, the, the, the country will have a national um, um, COVID-19 regulations that of course um, will ensure that all departments um, that execute functions in borders adhere to, in terms of how we adhere to uh, border management, uh, um, no, no, COVID-19 regulations. And however, in terms of the end-to-end -end processes that were put in place, um, it has of course been established that um, um, having various uh, departments, be it um, health, be it uh, immigration, customs, um, uh, Department of Agriculture and so forth. So you need, of course, uh, given the pandemic itself, to know which um, department um, uh, that needs to um, be the first in, 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 in the ecosystem as far as processing goods and passengers are concerned in, in our borders. So previously, you'll have, of course, immigration being the first entry or the first point of interaction when coming to processing passengers at land borders, um, as well as, of course, at air and, and at sea borders. But however, given the pandemic, it was established, of course, that it should be, you know, health that should be the first point of interaction. So that is where our end-to-end uh, -end process has, of course, changed as far as, you know, end-to-end um, -end process in, in our borders are concerned. And however, managing the borders as far as infrastructure is concerned, um, it has also always been established that we need to have all this department in, 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 um, in our borders, you know, be it uh, three types of, of borders, land, air, and, and as well as sea. So um, in 2009, before, 20, before 2010, then, um, the, the country, in particular, Department of Home Affairs, proposed a border management agency that it, that will be an entity that will be responsible for all, you know, the functions that are executed at all our uh, types of borders. So uh, that bill was passed, and the um, the border management authority has already been established. So it is in place as we speak, where all the functions of the departments that are responsible for border management in all our borders should fall within one entity. So meaning that the functions and the responsibilities of all departments that are responsible for the border management will then fall and report in within a border management authority that has already been established. So at this point in time, what is happening is that we are busy um, dealing with issue of categorization of ports, whereby we'll be able then uh, to ensure that we are categorize our ports so that we are able to determine you know, um, the, the, the types of ports and the types of, you know, um, uh, human resource that should manage the port, but then all the uh, personnel, the functions, the responsibilities from various departments will then be transferred to the, the border management agent so that they can report only to one agency moving forward. Rosina, this yes. is very interesting. So, so, so this is a new agency that uh, South Africa has put in place apart from home affairs to become the responsible for the borders and will be uh, taking with it some of the personnel that were in different sectors that were focused on, let's say, different verticals to the management of the border. So you, you've created now uh, an organization which is an integrated organization for border management. And yes. is that the, and, and is that is that your assessment this was needed in order to deal with the complexity that, that resulted from the pandemics or what what led to you taking that decision some some countries create a matrix where they say well we'll have an authority but they will have no staff they will be seconded to it as needed etc you seem to be talking about something very different what what motivated it if you may share what motivated um, the decision behind this um, was the fact that our borders became porous um, after democracy in 1994. And um, we were in terms of coordinating 
um, um, the functions at the airport. We are not, uh, or at our port, we are not able to can find, you know, um, solution pertaining to integrated functions, you know, be it um, the, um, the resources that we have to put in place uh, pertaining to health, the resources that we have to put in place pertaining to immigration, to custom and so forth. So if then we have to have multiple agencies having to report to activities that are executed at our ports, then we have a, a, a difficult situation in having a consolidated report or response in, in, in those particular areas. So for us to be efficient and effective in managing borders, you must have one entity that will respond to issues emanating or challenges emanating from health, challenges emanating from custom, from immigration, from um, agriculture, and so forth, you know, and as well as having, you know, an infrastructure that's, that is, that inter integrates the activities, you know, that, that should be executed by uh, various agencies, you know. So in some, our, some port, you'll have, you know, all the agencies in one building, and in some port, you'll have, you know, all it, uh, some agencies in various buildings, but then at the end of the day, you are unable to coordinate the functions that are executed, you know, by by these agencies in right. one order. So what was very important for the country was to ensure that as much as we want to have, you know, an understanding with reg regards to our international migration, both domestic and international, we really need to have one agency that will be able to um, assist the, uh, the country in determining, you know, um, or in providing information pertaining to the level of international migration and as well as the, the um, infrastructure that we have put in place to ensure that our borders are efficient, as much as possible. And we are also able to, uh, my apologies, we are also able to account, you know, for the in and out migration because of we, 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 we acknowledge that, you know, um, population increase as a result of, 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 of both, you know, net um, uh, birth and net migration. But as a country, we cannot be in a position where we, we are unable, you know, to, uh, in explain the element of net migration in our country based on the fact that we don't have integrated way of managing our borders, you know, in, into one integrated system. So one integrated system will assist the, uh, the country in ensuring that we manage our borders efficiently and then we are able to account as far as in and out migration is concerned. And we are also able to account on the growth of our population with regards to whether it, it's increased as a, as a result of net migration or as a result of this. So that is actually um, the reason why, you know, um, this idea or proposal came into effect in terms of, you know, who should be accountable. So you will have a lot of, you know, um, challenges, a lot of complaints, but then um, you will, most of the departments will not know which one should respond to what. But then if ever you have one, you know, entity that is responsible for all functions, then you will know that you will find an answer in one entity. So those will be integrated in one border management authority. Hold on to that thought, Rosina. I want to go to Damien. Damien, what do you see the trend in, 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 in institutional arrangements? Do you see the trend heading towards more and more of the South Africa change where they basically have one uh, integrated organization that just charge end to end with all aspects of the process? Or do you see a matrix solution that's emerging? Where, where are we? Do we have enough data? Do we have enough trends that you've ob observed that you can answer that question? Or maybe Alvina from, uh, from the ECOWAS region. Uh, why don't I let Zvina focus on the ECOWAS region. From, from where I sit, I can't say that we have the data. What we do see is that in our interaction with national authorities, this request is high up on their priorities. Right. The challenge, and I need to be frank, I think we have a lot to learn from how Kenya has done this, if I take the people there, and how South Africa are doing this as well, because it's difficult, and we've seen it in, in I mean, take, take the US, for instance, bringing in customs, immigration, health, and others to work well, together under a common leadership right. is a challenge per se. The moment, the moment you take any uh, government institution and say, well, now you need to deliver as one, it's difficult enough for the UN, it's even more difficult for some government. Now, there is a need and we'll get there, 
But it's not that easy also because it's something that you need to think from the start. If you go back to the legal identity discussion, the system, the infrastructure, it's not always designed. It's not always by design that you're enabling this to function. And I think this is something that we will be looking in the future. So as we promote legal identity, as we promote joint border management systems that are interoperable with custom systems, with health systems, et cetera, we need by design to focus on interoperability. Yeah? And that's possibly a message that, you know, for the, the private sector entity that come in and provides the system, it cannot be proprietary. It has to be by design, fully interoperable. Interoperable. But this interoperability does not necessarily mean an institutional arrangement that is coherent and unified. It could be essentially um, a stakeholders that are sort of governed by an extra uh, body that 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 the board that they belong all to. I mean, uh, the, the the surprise that I'm seeing from Kenya and South Africa. Um, I mean, they are telling us that that. These were have been in the making for a while, and they are putting them in place. Um, uh, COVID might have been the sort of the tip of the, the iceberg. Yeah. yeah, the accelerator. But there seems to be a reason. So it's it's one thing that we would love to to in the future sort of monitor and hear about as an institutional arrangement. As you, you may have seen in the previous episode, previous um, part of this episode, I'm keen on understanding institutional arrangements because. The success of something really depends on how the leadership is deployed. And we get asked that question all the time. Give us examples of institutional arrangements, even, even to the point of asking, how should the identity authorities be managed? Should they be part of ministry? Should they be part of an agency completely independent? Should they have ICT resources under them? Should they be? So to me, this is a perfect example of something that has a big, big impact. And we see now Kenya and South Africa having taken that decision. We would love to drill down and understand it deeper. Um, I mean, if, if you allow, and I think it'd be good to hear from Kenya and, and South Africa, one of the things that we have documented yeah. is that one of the calls for success is to have an entity which is above the different ministries promoting this way of working to ensure that it functions. If you give the leadership just to one department right. or one ministry, the others have a knee-jerk reaction. And, and I think if I remember correctly uh, from uh, the Director General of, of Kenya, it, it was, I, I was really uh, um, impressed by how he was talking about how at the airport, Entity X has the lead, but immigration is right behind. At the seaport, Entity X has the lead and immigration. But it's not that immigration wants to be at the forefront of every single entry. They recognize where there is value added, but to do that, you need vision and you need to have an entity which is which superposes the different departments basically right alexander uh, rosina shared with us a very interesting um institutional arrangement for management of the borders which south africa has has just put in place um can you comment on on the integrated institutional arrangement that kenya has put in place um do you have many different agencies and then they are coordinated by a coordination body or do you have an organization that is dedicated to management of the borders and they have the staff needed to do all aspects of that thank you so much for kenya we have a different one from south africa in our case uh, we have what we call the Border Control Operations and Coordination Committee. Now, this committee is normally a committee uh, which, is, which is composed of permanent secretaries from the various agencies which have a role at the border. Then under it, we have what we call the Border Management Secretariat. Now, this body is being headed by a secretary. And under him, we have various government agencies which have a role at the border and their work is to ensure that there is good coordination on all border control issues and uh, under them now we have what we call the border management committees at every border for example at all the airports mm. we have a border management committee which is normally headed by the kenya airports authority and uh, under it we have got all the agencies which have a role at the border and uh, yeah, then at, at, at the land borders, uh, uh, we have a border management committee, which is right. by the Kenya Revenue Authority. And it now uh, we have other agencies, but immigration in all these borders is, is deputizes. 
vision. That is the arrangement. But uh, the vision, where we want to move towards is we want to move to the South African model. Okay. And uh, we're trying now to look at the laws so that we, we now have one entity, right. one integrated border control agency. That is actually now the direction where we want to move. Okay. Okay. So, so we, we're going to watch that because that institutional arrangement is definitely interesting. In South Africa, and you're moving in that direction. Uh, we, we would like to learn more about it um, down the line. Hold on to that to, to that issue. I want to open up the the opportunity for Niger to 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 chime in. Um, and here for Niger, we have um, uh, the, we have the from the so Ministry of Interior. Um, the commissioner of the police that controls the borders, uh, Monsieur Cisse, he will speak actually in French. And then we have um, not a simultaneous translator. This is for the YouTube channel. It will be somebody who will consecutive translation. So um, Monsieur Cisse, s'il vous plaît, parlez lentement et, et prenez pause chaque, chaque phrase. Uh, comme ça, Diane peut uh, faire l'interprétation um, facilement. Um, so my first question is going to be basically getting the perspective from, from Niger on, on how complex, um, I mean, the, we talk about the border and, and, and the border management as one process, but in reality, um, I happen to have been aware of so many systems that exist at the border, some legacy, some new, you're adding the health system, you're adding the security checks, et cetera. How do you deal with this heterogeneity of all these systems? Do you insist on bringing a vendor to do this system integration? So you have a dashboard where everything will be reporting from these as inputs, or do you simply create a completely new platform and, 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 and build it to your specifications. What is your journey in terms of interoperability of system management? Is this a problem? Uh, uh, Merci beaucoup. Uh, Merci, uh, Dr. Atik. Bonsoir à, à tous. Uh, le Niger a effectivement uh, un passif, mais a aussi un, un actif de nos jours par rapport à la gestion euh, des frontières. Euh, des frontières, la friction euh, fronta, fronta, frontalière, si je peux dire, parce que euh, 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 très tôt, euh, le Niger a vu qu'avec l'évolution des nouvelles technologies de l'information et de la communication, euh, euh, beaucoup de secteurs publics euh, comme privé d'ailleurs s'en sont appropriés pour améliorer la qualité de la vie des populations en rendant les secteurs publics euh, beaucoup plus efficaces et très accessibles. Euh, Est-ce est que je peux juste commencer à traduire un petit oui, peu Oui, oui. Un ah, ok. Je pensais euh... que. Non, non, ce n'est pas la traduction simultanée, c'est la traduction um, consécutive, consécutive. Pour, pour cette partie. <laughs> Excusez-moi. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Acte. Good evening. The Niger has indeed an active and passive uh, history in terms of border uh, management and uh, front um, uh, border frictions. So, uh, very early on, the Niger has... Uh, observed that the evolution of these new technologies of information and communication had opened uh, public sectors uh, new uh, opportunities and appropriate um, means to uh, offer important um, opportunities and benefits for the life of the users. Merci beaucoup. Donc, je, c est, c est le cas, par exemple, de la gestion de l'identité numérique que fournit euh, euh, l'État et qui donne accès à un environnement digitalisé et euh, sécurisé. Into, so it's the case of the management of the digital identity that is offering the access of a digital identity that is safe and secure. Cela répond à une volonté et un besoin des autorités nigériennes à améliorer les capacités en matière de gouvernance électronique de communiquer en ligne plus efficacement avec 
euh, à l'interne la question du docteur Attic, c'est-à-dire entre les différents acteurs qui sont sur le terrain par rapport à la gestion euh, des frontières. Um... No, it's okay. So uh, this answers a need that is uh, both uh, um, a will and uh, also um, a strategy as well, of uh, will of the and strategy of the government to improve digitalization and improve the communication internally. And this also has to do with the question of Dr. Adek uh, regarding uh, how do we get the different players to communicate between them and to collaborate uh, with these, uh, within this border uh, management? Euh, donc, euh, cela a été beaucoup plus euh, axé ou bien a été beaucoup plus développé dans, en, 19, en 2015, suite à l'explosion de la migration irrégulière vers les côtes européennes, et surtout le développement exponentiel de la criminalité transfrontalière organisée autour des frontières nigériennes et bien au-delà. Um, uh, so this uh, has to do a lot, uh, this has uh, been ongoing and has been developed uh, essentially since uh, 2015 with the growth of irregular migration and including towards Europe and also the growth of crime across borders around Niger, but also uh, near the borders of Niger. Au Niger, uh, l'acteur principal de la gestion des frontières, c'est la police nationale. In Niger, the main actor of cross-border control is the national police. Mais euh, n'empêche, les autres structures, en l'occurrence, la douane, la santé, euh, euh, l'agriculture et, 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 et le, le, le ministère du, du commerce, en fait, toutes ces entités aussi concourent à la gestion frontalière, mais qui est une prérogative exclusive à la police nationale. And, but other structures such as the, um, uh, the immigration, the health, the agriculture, and the uh, business uh, trade also are involved in the management of the border, but the main holder of this management is the national police. Et c'est dans ce cadre que les services en charge de la gestion des frontières se sont dotés d'outils et d'instruments pour améliorer la gestion des frontières et aménager un cadre légal. Par exemple, euh, le Niger s'est doté euh, d'une politique nationale des frontières, le Niger s'est doté d'une politique nationale sur la migration. En 2015, nous avions euh, 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 adopté une loi dans le cadre de la lutte contre le trafic illicite des migrants, mais aussi le trafic des êtres humains et les infractions connexes. Un instant. Uh, uh, in, so, within this frame, uh, the services and, uh, are very diverse and a lot of uh, tools and, uh, have been developed uh, for, to improve the management uh, of the borders. And in, in the case of the legal frame, also, uh, there was a politic of um, uh, improving the, um, and the borders, the management, the migrations as well, and laws have been established to control uh, trafficking across borders and all kinds of insecurities, all kinds of crimes. Et c'est de ces constats que la nécessité d'une mise en place d'un dispositif cohérent de gestion et de contrôle frontalier a été décidé grâce au système d'enregistrement automatisé qu'on a au niveau de l'ensemble des postes frontaliers du Niger, que ce soit les postes frontaliers terrestres comme les postes frontaliers aériens, les aéroports, par exemple. Um, so there was uh, this uh, awareness regarding the need of a display of cross-border management that um, will allow, uh, that is allowed, including thanks to a system of uh, records that uh, we already had, 
in regards of uh, cross uh, border um, for the land border as well as air border in airports, for example. Ce système uh, uh, d'enregistrement de, automatisé, uh, Midas, par right. rapport à l'OIM. This uh, system of recording the cross-border um, uh, circulation is the Midas in opposition to the OIM. Uh, ce système permet une, permet une anticipation des actions grâce à la transmission en temps réel des informations concernant les voyageurs, les véhicules, les marchandises. C'est-à-dire, donc, vous le voyez, euh, beaucoup d'acteurs ont euh, leur place dans ce système ou bien peuvent avoir accès à ce système pour, euh, en fait, faire un travail collégial. Um, so the system allows the anticipation of the circulation due to a real-time uh, system and this allows to control uh, the circulation of uh, people, of the travelers, of vehicles and goods. And we can see that this involves a lot of players that are actors in the system, but also that needs uh, the, to be that need to be enabled to access the system. Oh, just a petit second. Um, Damien, this is an OEM system, Midas. Yeah, I wasn't sure what, what he was referring to. Le système d'enregistrement automatisé qui est Midas, c'est un système que l'OIM a implémenté pour le Niger. Oh, mais, mais c'est disponible pour, pour tous les pays. Qui peut être disponible maintenant, actuellement, le Midas est disponible dans 20 pays euh, du monde. Okay. The Midas system uh, was implemented by IOM uh, for us, this uh, automatic uh, border, automatic registration system. And it was also developed and made available for other countries. Actually, Damien, describe it a little bit quickly. No, I mean, my aim is not to be promoting Midas. So we're not in the business of selling Midas, but we, we have a border management information system, which is gonna be rolled out in, I think now it's over 24 countries. It's heading to 33 countries the last time I looked basically um, doing what a border management system should be doing. You know, it scans your documents, uh, checks it with national alert list, checks it with Interpol. And in Niger, the interesting part is that there's an American system called Pisces at the airport. The land yeah. borders are managed by IOM and the interoperability of the of two of them also talking to the Interpol is one of the beauty of the Niger system, basically how different systems can work together. Okay, so and, and, and it's working together because you've got a middleware or you've got basically an interoperability layer due to data being come. Com. How did you achieve the stocking? It's not magic. No, I think what, it, what needs to be very clear is the data never ever belongs to IOM. This is a government of Niger data. Right. And we support them when they say we want a central piece of server if you want where the various information comes talks to each i'm simplifying huh? talks to each other it's sent back to both system then by design this is what we do and so it's a middleware integration exactly. yeah. okay okay and that's very important um so so um niger is able to have all the different lanes border and air air um, uh, borders and basically be able to get a, a, an overview and and but also what i heard here is that this is not a single uh, institution user there's a multi stakeholder each of them have a role to play in that platform so i want to say yes but i think it's i'd rather leave it to niger commissaire uh, sissé je crois que vous comprenez parfaitement la question donc je vais vous laisser répondre oui on, on a entendu que Les acteurs, les parties prenantes, oui. ils ont un rôle dans les systèmes. Ils, 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 ils ont leur, euh, leur, leur, leur plateforme, ils participent. They, they, they participate in the MIDAS as, as users with specific roles and responsibilities defined by different uh, organizations, health, uh, police, customs, etc. Am I correct in saying that? Oui. Euh, 
vous avez raison de le dire. Seulement, je, je, je tiens à préciser que le système Midas est beaucoup plus utilisé par la police nationale. Okay. Maintenant, euh, les, les informations récoltées, parce que comme j'ai eu à l'expliquer, ce sont des informations en temps réel. Euh, yeah. euh, donc, si un autre acteur a besoin, par exemple, euh, euh, au cours de cette année, juste en deux, le, le premier trimestre de, ce, de cette année, nous avons euh, euh, eu à retrouver une bonne dizaine de véhicules déclarés, volés, euh, que ce soit au Niger ou ailleurs, parce que ce système interagit presque au, en temps réel au niveau de l'ensemble des frontières. Okay. Let, let, let the translator translate, please. Uh, yes, you are right to say that, uh, but the MIDAS uh, here is essentially used by the national police. It, as I mentioned, it uh, gathers information in real time. So if another actor from the ecosystem ha needs the, the information, we can act. For example, in the first trimester, Uh, of this year, we had 10 vehicles that had to be found because they were stolen. And we were able to have all the borders interact to be able to find uh, these informations. Okay. Okay, so this is the power of, of information systems uh, deployed at the border. L let me ask you just one quick question. What would you say the one lesson that you've learned from the COVID pandemic in management of the border? Is there an important lesson that you can share with, uh, with our quelle leçon vous avez appris uh, the pandemic, the COVID, the COVID? Uh, le, le cas du Niger. Oui. Uh, la, la COVID uh, nous a permis uh, de, de voir effectivement uh, cette, euh, euh, au niveau des frontières, d'accord, euh, que la, le contrôle frontalier est primordial et important. Parce que c'est pendant cette période où, normalement, avec la fermeture, vous le savez bien, des frontières, que nous avons, en tout cas, la police a eu à faire beaucoup de saisies, de saisies de, la, de, de, de drogue, que ce soit euh, la chambre indienne, comme aussi de drogue dure, comme la cocaïne. Mais c'est aussi pendant cette période qu'on a pu faire le contrôle de beaucoup euh, de, de, de migrants et surtout de trafiquants de migrants. Mmh. Et ah. tout, cela, tout cela était dû au fait des systèmes de contrôle, des systèmes de gestion intégrée qui étaient au niveau de ces postes frontaliers. OK. Diane um, Yes. So... Uh... In the case of uh, Niger, COVID allowed us to see that the border control was a very important but also essential factor. The uh, police, by closing the borders during the COVID, has been able to hold on even other factors such as drugs. So they have been apprehending uh, hard drugs like cocaine, but also a lot of migrants and uh, trafficking of migrants. So this has shown the importance of uh, international uh, border management. Okay, let, let, thank you. Let's take a short pause and go to some of the community voices that have joined us. I'll start with Mark. Mark, you, you joined. Please state your name, your organization, and your question or comment. Yeah, <clears throat> hello. This is, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Artik, for giving me uh, the opportunity to, to talk. So, um, I am the, uh, one of the founders and the chief technical officer of Copernic, and we are a company specialized in mobility. And uh, this is really the point I want to make uh, right now, uh, because we know that we have uh, beautiful systems uh, that works for the airline industry, like uh, API, PNR. Uh, we also have systems for uh, uh, all the ships and so on. So Maritime is, uh, is working quite well and is moving towards uh, API, PNR as well. And we have uh, fixed land borders that are uh, really good and connected and starting to be uh, as connected as possible. And we have beautiful systems, really. Uh, but the frontier is, uh, I would say, ubiquitous because uh, basically uh, it's not only at the frontier that you need to be able to control and to assess if someone is uh, who they claim to be and if they have the right to be there. Uh, you have to be able to do that anywhere uh, and at any time. Uh, and I mean that you need to be able to do that even if you do not have a connection to the network, 
and even if you do not have a, a connection to a, to a power source and so on. So uh, my point here is really to, to say that we need as an industry representative to understand uh, how we can provide tools, mobile tools, uh, to be able to control identity, to make sure that the person is who they claim to be, and also to be able to control if they have the right to be there or if they have the right to do what they are doing. And this is a, uh, this is a, a bit what uh, Mr. Cisse said about the, the fact that many different um, agencies need to share data and to provide uh, control tools. So, I mean, the, the challenge is the lack of infrastructure. I mean, at the end of the day, you are talking about the fact that um, no two points in a border are alike. I mean, borders are formed by natural boundaries and sometimes man-made boundaries that have made them even unnat more unnatural than they are. And the question becomes, um, is there effective paradigms of, of border management um, with minimal infrastructure? Um, obviously, mobile devices are, are key to that, but data is the heart and soul of, of border management. And, and if we don't have connectivity, um, I mean, making decisions on the spot becomes a, a big, big challenge. Are you aware of of environments where border management is running on a on a USSD channel or, or through SMS, or are, are we imagining situations where those borders are hopeless? You can't you can't manage them, or is it something we can do offline? I think we can do a lot offline uh, as long as people can have documents that we can control that we can uh, check in terms of. Um, are they issued by the right authority? Are they real? And is the person who's holding the documents uh, the, the real person? And then we can look at visas and all of that should be able, we should be able to do that offline. If you can do that uh, already, uh, that's uh, something that uh, is very, very useful. Um, but now when you have no documents and, and I'm just thinking about the trend that, you know, uh, all the identity should go digital and no documents and no nothing. I think there is a point where uh, you cannot really achieve connectivity anywhere. And so you still have to have some, some things, some credential that uh, allows you to, uh, to express who you are and that you have a real document. And, uh, Thank you for, for reminding us about that. In fact, this is an important topic that we will need to address going forward, which is the offline identity management in no matter what, uh, whether it is in a, in a border or even in any uh, service delivery for social protection programs. Uh, there are remote areas where there's just no way you're going to be able to establish the, the authenticity, et cetera. So we need to fig figure out offline identity management within risk models. I don't know if anybody on the panel has anything to add to this or we can move on to, to Pam. Um, I'll be really yes. I would agree. Where we operate are usually in the most remote areas where there's no electricity, there may not, not be coverage, et cetera. Although granted, coverage is coming in most places. It's not that difficult to have a system that to have an offline system that checks whether the document in front of you is valid. What I see for me, there are two challenges. The first one is what you raised about we need to ensure people have credentials, not just because we need to check them, but people actually like having credentials. And I think it's important to remember that. They like to have a paper to be able to show. Them. That's the first thing, we need credentials. The second thing is we need clear, at least either regional or African-wide, and I think the World Bank is working on that, we need clear standards for those, for those documents and those credentials. Because if we end up having different credentials at different places and no capacity to verify them offline because they have different credentials, different standards, that becomes problematic, yeah? So we need credentials, we need standards. And then whether we're offline or not, we have system where we connect and then when we have connectivity again, everything gets uploaded, downloaded, but that's the reality of the work basically. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks for this point. Mark, thank you for reminding us about that. Uh, Pam, let me go to you. Oh, well, first, thank you so much, Joseph. And I was so pleased uh, with the conference in, in Morocco. So I was a participant in workshop two. Um, so for me, I'm the executive director of the World Privacy Forum. I also co-chair 
the research academic and technical network at the World Health Organization, where I also participated in their rewrite of their data protection principles in 2020. So I wanted to first um, affirm um, all the things that Rosina said. She made one of the most important, probably the most important intervention in the entire workshop in her discussion of an integrated ecosystem level approach to the border management. I, something that Rosina did not say on this um, uh, live cast is that she has very advanced degrees in statistics. So she understands the ecosystem, she understands the data and she has the capacity to analyze very extensive and complex data ecosystems. This is really an important factor and I wanted to bring it forward. And Joseph, you touched on that by saying that it's really about the data and it is. At the end of the day, we've got an ecosystem, a very complex ecosystem with lots of data. We need all of the actors in that data ecosystem to make it function well. So the stakeholders I would add would be, uh, we need civil society stakeholders. We, we actually need private and public sector stakeholders within the public sector or government stakeholders, it is absolutely essential that we have um, health stakeholder or stakeholders, as well as the legal stakeholders, which would be the data protection authorities, but other st legal stakeholders as well. We must have the national statistical offices as well. So it's really a whole of government approach. And I really like what South Africa has done placing a whole ecosystem, but in one space. So there is a whole of government approach, but a unified central access point. I really like the solution. I know it has to be adapted for other contexts, but I think it's really important. So what we then come to is what role do the stakeholders play in the ecosystem? I think this is where there's a lot of wiggle room and where it's very important for each jurisdiction, each country to define what role those stakeholders will and can play. And that will change as capacity develops over time. Um, and then just, and I just think that's really important because that's something that does not receive much attention. What are the roles? What are the functions of these different stakeholders? And then um, just a very brief final point, which is this. It's really important when we talk about the health ecosystem that we distinguish between public health and other forms of health. So health data ecosystems, we can think of them as a giant apple or pie. <laughs> and um, public health, the COVID-19 COVID slice of the pie is one subsection of a very large ecosystem. What we find at the borders is not the whole health ecosystem, it's the public health ecosystem. And this in all countries of the world that I know of is regulated separately from the main health ecosystem. So it is actually um, more readily uh, able to be integrated than one might initially think. And then um, just to conclude, I wanted to add one last thought, which is this, something that's really important. We must build trustworthy systems that benefit people and the planet. We, there has to be balance. Um, but along the way, it's really important to build in incentives for ongoing models of improvement. I really like what I've heard on this webcast on how the identity authorities are working to improve the flaws they find in the system. We, we shouldn't punish people when we see flaws. We need to alert them to the flaws and those authorities are then responsible for correcting the flaws. They don't correct no. them, then then you can have punishment. But I think ongoing improvement is so important. Thank now, you, Joseph. Um, mm -hmm. um, while I have you, while I have you on, one of the issues that we see in in, in border is that, as we just mentioned, as you reiterated, also this is a data centric process. More and more decisions are being based on data, and I see that there is no coherent standard for what data should be collected at the border. Some countries collect certain data, others collect other types of data. And for a, a, a World Privacy Forum that con is concerned about the proliferation of data, um, to what extent should we be insisting on a standard for data collection to define 
what data should be collected and for how long it should be collected and for what purpose should be collected and how is the consent working. Obviously, people say, well, uh, I, am, I am sovereign. So if you're coming to my country, I want to sell, I want to collect any data that I feel I need. Uh, is this view narrow-minded and how can we um, bring more modern data-centric practices to the border management process? Yes, it is a great temptation for a country to say, we're sovereign, let's get all the data we possibly can from biometric to demographic data, you name it, even transactional data on the mobile devices, let's get it all and collect it. But actually the truth is, is that there are great liabilities we have learned that are attached to data. And it is really important to, to address the idea of data minimization. So there are now 147 countries in the world, many of them are in Africa now, that have baseline data protection regulation in these models that are in Africa, which are by and large very similar to uh, the GDPR model in Europe. They, but they are made uh, appropriate for the African uh, jurisdiction and context. The important thing to understand is that is already built into many of the, the data protections within Africa. It's a good model. Minimizing data helps people, but it also helps the government and allows them to reduce their data risk, the risk of data breach, and also the risk of fraud within and without the, of the government. So um, I do think that it is a more modern approach to minimize data, to decide exactly what it is that you need to prevent harm, but also to ensure public trust. You need both. There yeah. must be a balance. So, so I think this is an important objective um, for the borders, which is, is not free for all. Uh, I think you could do it and take all the data you want, but you are opening yourself to a, a bad image or you're opening yourself to certain liability if you just simply collect all the data that you want that, is, that feels invasive. And so, um, good point. Um, minimize the data to whatever you need in order to run your business process and including whatever you need to protect your country from any public health issues that would, would arise. I'm hoping that this data-centric view of the border will be a recurring theme that will, will be helping uh, stimulate some dialogue between the countries and also uh, partners like the IOM in the future. So thank you for reminding us about that and for raising it. Um, I think we need to um, end this session here, but I'd like to um, give Damien, as the as the chair of, of the workshop, physical workshop, um, the privilege, if he wants to, to say a closing remark, and then I'll come in and, and close. Um, no, I haven't particularly prepared uh, welcoming remarks. I, I would want to say, I think what you've, what you've touched upon there, looking at the borders, is the absence of standards. Ce que je voulais toucher au niveau des I can, I can hear from the Actually, uh, operator, operator, the translator is in the wrong room. Could you please shut Diane from the room and put her back in the room? Sorry. Sorry, Damien. No, it's okay. And I think that's a key point. You know, on travel documents, you have very specific standards, right? On, on how to manage your borders, you only have best practices or recommended practices. And so to take this data minimization, for instance, when we come out and talk about our, our MIDA system, governments from the start say, oh, we want to collect 150. Exactly. <laughs> our aim is to come back and say, no, with this amount of limited data, you should be enough. And there's a trade-off. The more data you collect, the more people stay at your borders, the longer they stay at your border, the more unhappy they are about crossing your borders, yeah? Exactly. And if you've just traveled 12 hours, you don't want to wait two hours in line because somebody's collecting too much data. So, but the important thing is we don't have something to point to and say, you must do this. The right. only thing we can say is this is a good practice. And I think this community where we share good practices is how we can influence our member states yeah. to say, you are sovereign, you need to reflect upon this. And based on this, you need to make your decisions, yeah? And from our side, the new challenge is how to do this when it was border management in normal times to now border management in crisis time where we can make mobility more predictable. And I think that will be my, my concluding remarks on the challenges ahead of us. Yeah, and, and, and just, just to um, finish on the data point, um, often the data protection laws 
are actually not uniform in the sense they don't treat collection of data of, of, of residents the same way they treat to visitors. They allow themselves what they don't allow for their own residents. I, I know the US, for example, has a different standard for what they, what they collect uh, for the people who are coming into the US. They do take biometrics for visitors, which they don't dare to do with their own citizens, etc. So we, we need to be consistent and we need to understand that data it has a double edge. And so we'll, we'll, we'll revisit the subject at another time. So I want to thank you so much. Thank you to the IOM. Thank you to the contributors for animating the uh, workshop. I think uh, there's been a lot of interesting points that have been raised. We look forward to continuing this journey in a, in a working group and continuing to push this, this process forward. Um, um, so thank you. And um, one last thing. So, operator, uh, we can thank the this, the panelists and take them off the stage. Um, so, I want to remind everybody that this Thursday we are going to continue this um, summary of the workshops with workshop three and workshop four. Workshop three is a UNICEF chaired workshop, and it's highly highly focused on a very specific problem, which is. Mission 100, how do we achieve 100% um, universal birth registration uh, when we're looking at the, where we are in many countries, we're far from that. So we're going to look at very specific recommendations that move the needle, that have an impact. And the objective of this workshop is to take those recommendations and, and, and give them as an input to the upcoming um, ministers in charge of CRVS coming up in October. So we want this continuity of engagement to take place and we will be doing that uh, through, through the workshop number three. Workshop number four is also a very, very important workshop which had to focus on basically how do we know uh, that identity systems are achieving their objectives and, 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 and actually delivering value to society. So we can, we can um, communicate about them, we can have transparency about them, and we can also monitor and evaluate so that we can continually improve them. There's a lot of interesting lessons there, but also the World Bank has prepared for us a, a very special um, presentation to give us guidelines in terms of how to, to deal with the communication aspect and the monitoring aspect and evaluation aspect of ID systems. So we'll be seeing you in, in two days. So please um, come back and let us uh, engage in that discussion. Thank you again very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atkins.